Hello and welcome. My name is Julia Hardy and thank you so much for joining us for this special event. I presume you're here because you wanted to learn a little bit more about how Assassin's Creed Valhalla was made. And I'm not going to lie, you are in exactly the right place to find that out. So the footage that you're about to see was originally shot just for kind of journalists and media. And what ended up happening was all these fantastic stories and experiences came out from, uh, you know, from all the, the, the people involved that Ubisoft thought it'd be a bit of a disservice to not kind of release it out into the world and share it with you guys. So... We had like some incredible speakers, you know, from Ubisoft Montreal to like the actors involved, to the historians, to one of the composers, like, you know, from uh, making the soundtrack as well. And all of them were just really honest and open about kind of their experience of working on the game. And it was, it was pretty, pretty great stories that came out of it. It's um, been broken down into four kind of thematic sort of round tables uh, with the, yeah, obviously different themes. So we've got Viking fantasy, we've got history, we've got Nordic mythology, and we've got Vikings in entertainment. And look, I know the guys from Ubisoft are really, really excited to kind of uh, give this out there so that you guys can understand a little bit more about the kind of incredible journey that the entire team went on to make this game. And I'm really excited too. And I think, you know what, just to like, Get in the mood, we should watch this. They are heartless. Godless barbarians. Blindly. They scar the lands of England. Lands they will never defend. Never love. The time has come to speak to them in a language they will understand. Shields! 
Hi, everybody, and welcome to our very first Assassin's Creed Valhalla panel, which is all about Viking fantasy and how they've gone about creating it. And honestly, I am totally here to find out how I can create my own Viking fantasy. But I can just play the game. And I've got some of the guys here who have pulled it all together and are going to tell you exactly how they've done it. So joining us today, we have Darby McDevitt, it's narrative director for Ubisoft Montreal. We have Julien Laferriere, the producer for uh, Ubisoft of Montreal and uh, Magnus Brunn and uh, Cecilia Stenspil, who are both playing Eivor in the game as well. So welcome, everybody. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Good, thanks. Good, thanks. Oh, very good. Yeah, really succinct and together. <laughs> <laughs> this is perfect. Well, look, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, everyone is, uh, you know, online has been talking about how excited they are to find out more about Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So hopefully we can kind of like dig into a little bit of how you've created this uh, incredible world that we're all about to dive into. Um, I suppose my first question, though, and probably would be to Julien, would be why Vikings? What was the kind of decision making process there? Uh, because Vikings are awesome. Uh, that's it. Like, the end. They're awesome, the end. so we have to make a game about it. That's it. Um, next question. No, <laughs> uh, no, seriously, it's, uh, uh, there's there's more to it than that. Um, but Vikings are awesome. Um, so we um, we wanted to do Vikings for for quite a while. Actually, we knew that the the fans were requesting a Viking setting for Assassin's Creed, um, and after Origins, so we've did you know, the massive world of Egypt, and we felt we had the ingredients to make the Viking fantasy come to life. So we felt uh, it was the right moment. And we were actually really excited about making a game about Vikings. Uh, but we we didn't know if the top management of the company wanted to make uh, a game uh, with uh, within the Viking universe. So uh, we had to prepare ourselves. But really, very, very early on, we knew that, um, you know, Vikings were, were the way to go for the next one. Yeah. So, I mean, d when you kind of put this together, if you're kind of having to go to management uh, and, and this sounds just so kind of boringly officey, but do you have to like put together like a PowerPoint presentation? Like, how do you pitch it to them? What do you do? Uh, so we uh, we didn't know what we were up to. Right. We didn't know uh, if they wanted to make a game about Vikings. We definitely wanted to. Um, so we prepared ourselves, but we didn't want to go for the traditional PowerPoint format, you know, and present it. So we we created basically we did our research and we found out kind of four key moments in history where Vikings were, were, were part of and we created those giant posters where um, you know we kind of depicted what it would an Assassin's Creed game within that era would be like so we we've created those big posters put them out roll them in and just flew them to Paris and we had basically planned a whole day of kind of presentation around those posters and everything and after an hour in uh, they said, "All right, go Vikings invasion of England. That's the best. We, 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 you know, we support you." And that was actually our first choice. So we were like, "Okay, it's eleven o'clock. Wow, we had the full day. So <laughs> what do we do? At what time the terrace are opening? Can we can we go? Now? All right, so <laughs> bonus afternoon so out in Paris that you weren't expecting. Champagne. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, yeah, that's so we amazing. for a whole day, and yeah, that's it." Yeah. So that's the, the beginning yeah. of Valhalla. Yeah, well, what a great way to start it off. That's fantastic. Um, so obviously, you know, uh, for, from that kind of like period and that setting, there's obviously like a huge amount that you could choose to sort of put within the game. How do you kind of, because you could need to make it a reasonable size. You know, I don't want to be like 80 still finishing off uh, like a quest within the game. So how, how do you kind of uh, make sure it's a, a, of the right size, but with the big enough scale that everyone's kind of jaw drops? So we were we were fortunate enough to start the uh, or development right after Origins and while Odyssey was also being you know in the last uh, in the last year or so so we were able to kind of to see the the reaction of players both from Origins and Odyssey um, and we knew that that players liked the size of the you know the massive open world that we created uh, but we knew also that you know the playtime in those games were were kind of increasing by by quite a lot so we knew that after after 60, 70, 80 hours of play, um, players were actually looking to have some, some, some variety. So where we invested most of our effort is to make sure that um, we would still be uh, feeling very fresh after 80 hours of gameplay, whether it's with uh, the location types, the enemy archetypes, and so on. We wanted to keep some surprises in for the for the players. Um, so we invested very early on in our research and our prototypes. How can we create even more variety 
in all the different setups and quests that we have in the game to really be able to still surprise the players down the road. I suppose I should chuck that uh, sort of follow-up question to uh, Derby then, which is, you know, obviously, you know, what are kind of going to be the big differences? Because obviously Assassin's Creed has got this long-standing, uh, you know, franchise and every time you bring out a new game, you have to kind of weigh up what you're going to keep the same and kind of what you're going to do different. So what are kind of the some of the things that are going to be a bit different in this particular uh, iteration? Um, well, we w- the... The, one of the big innovations I think we made is on how we tell our story. Um, we are an action RPG. Action RPGs come with a lot of um, uh, s- sort of standard ways of telling their story. You usually have like a main path, you know, quest that takes you through the center of your game. And then uh, on the side, your your hero character will have a bunch of other sort of side quests that they gather up and uh, little things like, oh, this person had a cat stuck in a tree this guy had a you know an alligator down a well i'll write those down i'll go back and get to them later and they all those quests kind of fit the um the attitude of your character whether you're like um um a, a, a medjai as you were in origins or a um a, a mercenary in odyssey all these characters it makes sense for them to roam around and gather up quests from people with uh, Valhalla, we're playing a character who is invading another country, so we didn't think that uh, it made a lot of sense for you to have a main story, and then a bunch of other side quests that you just also vacuum up uh, as you're exploring the world. It, 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 what it would mean is you'd kind of have to just say, only Vikings will ask Eivor for help, but we wanted to get to know all the Saxons as well, and all the other and the Britons that were living there at the time. We also wanted to model our story after the sagas of the Icelanders and all the the, uh, the sort of Viking sagas, uh, which are not uh, um, like re- little redemption arcs that we're used to in Western literature. They're much more like um, uh, episodic, like a Don Quixote or a, a Huckleberry Finn. So when we took those kind of two things together, we created this story that has lots of episodic content where you'll go into a territory and you'll experience like a three hour story and it'll feel like you just lived through a a cool epic movie. You'll come back to your settlement and you'll feel like very satisfied. Like I just saw a piece of story content. And while you're doing those nice little arcs, you'll run into very small little things we call world events, which are just little tiny drops of crazy, surreal, funny characters that, um, cleanse the palate, um, brighten the mood, let's say, take you in a different direction. You've, you've changed a bit of a way of how everyone kind of discovers these things as well. So it, it doesn't feel quite yeah. so like, you know, you're kind of going through this side quest checklist. It feels more natural because then it sort of it feels like, I guess it's got a much kind of uh, easier and more exciting flow. Exactly. You have Eivor's quest and they're all about your settlement. You're all about your clan. They're all about making alliances. And then everything else we just want you to discover. Um, and because a sense of surprise is the essence of discovery, not knowing what's around that corner or what's underneath that Roman ruin or in those bushes, um, you have to be surprised. <laughs> and so we, we tried to, uh, yeah. <laughs> I know what's in the bushes. Uh, well, you do. But uh, yeah, I put him there. Um, but uh, <laughs> but we want the player to be, to be surprised as often as possible. Um, and so th- I think there's a really nice balance um, between surprise and then this epic form of storytelling. So, I mean, okay, so we talked a little bit about uh, kind of uh, the world and like how we kind of create this uh, Viking fantasy. And obviously the cornerstone of, you know, the experience of Valhalla is going to be who we play as, which is uh, Eivor. So I'd love to bring in uh, Magnus and uh, Cecilia about... I, I think actually, you know what, my first question has to be... What was the made up thing they told you that you were auditioning for? Because they always make a thing up, like something random, because they never tell you it's going to be Assassin's Creed, right? <laughs> like no one tells you that off the bat. I, were, I was auditioning for um, the Black Wolf Saga, which was an animated television series, which was pretty cool. And uh, so I sent uh, my tape uh, on the way and waited a couple of weeks. And then my, my agent... Um, called me and said that uh, so that tape um, they want to see you in London uh, for a, a two day edition and it it it's it's Ubisoft and we didn't know that know that Ooh. before so, like, so it, this could be uh, it could be Assassin's Creed but but don't did they whisper it and, uh, well 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 she did actually <laughs> my my agent and then then I um, 
<laughs> and then I uh, I flew to London and uh, I got into the the audition room with uh, four of the the uh, directors of the game. Uh, and Darby was there just going, so this is Assassin's Creed Valhalla and this is going to be... Well, it, he You're didn't like... say Valhalla because that name was not um, well, not fixed yet, but the, this was the yeah. new Assassin's Creed and it was in, in, set in, in this uh, Viking age. And um, and then we just, well, started uh, doing all the auditions. And um, it was um, it was quite interesting actually how... Um... You um you found um, Cecilia as well, obviously, because that that's a kind of interesting story. Just before we kind of get into sort of that full uh, process, but um yeah, because it was you were you were actually kind of like quite close to the wire, but without uh, the the female voice yet. So yeah, as uh, as Magnus said, we we found our um, our male uh, Avor. Um, he had auditioned for Sigurd, but we liked him so much that we sort of swapped him over to that <laughs> you know column A. Um, he actually came to uh, Montreal and, and did a test shoot with us but at that time we were still like we're still looking for our female A4 we just don't know and he's like oh, <laughs> don't panic name. but and he he wrote a name on a piece of paper uh, slid it across the table did he and uh, <laughs> we <laughs> and did we we sent it to, and we sent it to our uh, we sent it to our uh, audio team here they they took care of it and they um, arranged a call with Cecilia's uh, agent um, and then and then suddenly we were in a room listening to her, but she can tell you how that went. <laughs> yeah, because it's a it's a kind of crazy story. Because my my agent called me, and 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 I was actually shooting two different TV series in Denmark, so I was very busy, and I didn't have time for for anything actually. And he was like, "You have to audition for this. Uh, it's a saga thing. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's a game or something." I was like. Steen, it's it's gonna be. Uh, I, I'm gonna have to do it on my telephone, uh, on Skype or something. And uh, there was no room in my house, so I had to go out on the balcony. There was a bit quiet out there. I thought, but there was a football game in the background, so I was just actually screaming into my <laughs> phone on Skype, going for Odin, you know, very loud. And my neighbors were staring up and going, "What the? <laughs> Is she okay up there?" You know, and the, and then the, I actually landed the part, and I. I, I, it was good. I didn't know it was for Assassin's Creed because then I was I, I was definitely going to be so much more nervous than I was because this was just like going on into just doing a casting just fast and just be getting into the situation. But if I had known it was for mm. such a huge, massive job like Assassin's Creed, I would have been so scared. So I'm I'm feeling very, very privileged that I landed the part. So thank you, Maunus. It was all your call. So thank you. Oh, no, it's, it all sounds a bit spy-like, that whole story sliding in across the table and then you put in a call yeah. for people and suddenly da, 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 it's all very... Yeah. I don't know what goes on behind the It's the yeah, Danish way. Secretive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Danish way, writing things on paper and sliding. All, all Danes are part Viking of the hidden style. Ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I mean, you know, as as actors, I suppose we should we should definitely touch upon this. You know, like normally, you know, if, if your your guys' experience is more kind of you know from like TV and, and movies and things like that, and it's you're obviously playing a character in a game is a very very different experience. I suppose it's kind of quite fun as well because actually then you get to kind of like whereas you know normally it's quite linear. You're like, oh, my character does this, 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 and then it's the end of the TV series or whatever. But whereas you know in a video game, you're going off in all these different directions so actually you're kind of getting to fully really go into the characters right yeah you 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 dive in deep uh, into this um darby he told me that uh, this is this is quite similar to playing the lead in a television series for 10 seasons and you are wow. in every scene um oh. so i i think me and cecilia had around eleven thousand lines uh, for Avor, um, which is massive. Um, I've never done anything that huge before. Uh, so it, that is, you, you, you get a chance to, to, well, try out all feelings mm. in the book, so to speak. And that is, that is pretty cool. Mm. Also in, in some of the same scenes, because um, the player will have choices and you play a scene and, and it's hardball. Ava wants something. Boom, 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 boom. Then you play it again, and um, I know, no, he's he, he really doesn't want this, uh, or whatever, or now I don't like her, or you know, it's 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 so you 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 it's switcheroo all the time um, because of these uh, these choices, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's. I mean, Cecilia, how how was it for you? Game. It was super fun. It's super fun to be able to work with a, a massive character like this because you're you she's 
she's a complex she he complex lone wolf kind of uh, character with a strong motivation for glory and also for creating a home you know so she's really ambitious but she's also you know the important thing when you create a character is always to get the the audience or in this case the player to follow the 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 human you're making so 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 in in this case you have 11,000 lines so you, and and you need to 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 kind of take your player and and by the hand and 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 and, and let them meet Avo in all various situations and that's that's been such a a great journey and i hope that that the players when they they play the game that they will you know join Avor cuz cuz yeah. she's off for a thrill ride you know yeah um so i suppose um, i should talk to uh uh julian and darby a little bit about um obviously you know uh you can play as male or female uh Eivor, but also you can actually sort of switch as the game's kind of going through was this kind of always the sort of plan from the start and, and it's also you know a bit unusual to be able to f switch between uh the the genders of a character as you're kind of going through yeah, it is. It was a feature that was first um, uh, given to Assassin's Creed in, in Odyssey, and it was a really appreciated feature. Uh, and we wanted to take it just a step further and just say, what if that character switching, what if that dual identity was actually part of the story? Um, so, and, and once we actually did that, we, we thought, well, why can't you, if it's part of the story and, and we do it in this mm -hmm. way, why can't you switch back and forth? It makes sense kind of for our story. I and mean, we were a science fiction slash historical uh, series. So we found some fun, interesting ways um, to justify this. And, and for the people who just play as, let's say you pick just one or the other, you're going to have the same story. But if you play, if you switch back and forth or, uh, or you play as our center option, which is called Let the Animus Decide, you'll start to under understand this mystery um, beneath the the whole game. Um, it's not a mystery you need to understand to enjoy the whole game, but it gives you that extra little spice. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that actually people will play it a few times and they'll get all the nuances of, of the both sides of the character, let's say, the male and the female aspect, um, which is cool. Uh, but really, play I mean, it how you like, because that's how we made it. I think what's great about it is that we're able to, um, to have a pretty big range because of it like we are true to our lore so we are you know we're catering to like hardcore fans of the franchise but because you are able to switch at any time uh, more casual players who just joined us who just wanted to have a good time and see uh, you know how does uh, for example May Malevor would react in this situation they're able to do so very quickly without you know starting a game over again so I think it's an option that makes a lot of sense for the franchise but that is very accessible at the same time so we're we're really happy to kind of find our own kind of way on the gender choice thing for us it, it, it would just like when it, it just fits super well together and uh, you know by being mm very true to our lore, but being very accessible. So it just, it just made sense. Uh, what was the kind of final count for the, for the script? Like, was it so big if you printed it, you could change light bulbs? Y yeah. <laughs> yeah, you change light bulbs in, uh, in like uh, Madison's A church. Uh, <laughs> the, the, it's, uh, I think the final count was if we do male and female Eivor lines together, so 11 times two for them, the whole count was something like 36,000 lines for the whole game. Um, and that's not including all the stuff that the guards bark at you when they're trying to kill you. That's a whole other section. Uh, we call that the yeah. We, we call that the onos and all that. Or, and that's not the, yeah. It's the onos. You know when you're going uh, ah, eh, ah, uh, and we have our and our all the retakes. Go like, yeah, and all yeah. the retakes. Yeah. But you have you have a fun like uh, when you go into yeah. the, the onos. They're like uh, short st uh, sound like you've been stabbed in the stomach with a dagger. Uh, okay. Now heavy sound like you've been knocked on the head with a hammer. And you have to do this for hours and hours. <laughs> no, we, we have uh, we have some cool, of course, uh, directors and some cool... Uh, we have a lot of help around us to create the character, too. So we have got a, a lot of guidelines, too. But uh, but uh, mm. but uh, I've, I've been doing voice work for 30, 30 years. So 
And I, I really love doing Onos, actually. I think it's huge. It's so much fun to kind of <laughs> dig into how do you sound when you get thrown off a mountain? Or how do you sound if it's just a small <laughs> cliff? Or, like, oh, like, oh, like, oh. But uh, uh, sometimes uh, it, that, that's why I think my neighbor just stared at the balcony because I was shouting very loud, you know. So, yeah. One day you're going to be in danger and no one will come because they'll be like, oh, she's just doing a voice. Uh, <laughs> oh, just the actress. <laughs> again you know you know yeah. the woman who yeah. cried over <laughs> The old yeah, the woman yeah. who cried out. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, look, I'm so sorry. We're gonna, we've are gonna we run out of time for this particular session, but we're bringing each one of you back uh, for a whole plethora of uh, discussions that we've got. And uh, so just want to say thank you ever so much uh, for, for joining us. And uh, to all you guys watching, uh, we'll be back very soon with our next panel. You intrigue me, Wolfkist. Orphan and sibling warrior and poet you are many in one it seems hey boy see good <laughs> i missed you brother Ramsey, your husband returns bringing gifts and riches to share and new friends i see we cannot stay in norway not without fueling more war so we push forward a new kingdom awaits from here to Valhalla, I will always be on your side, Sigurd. Always. Eivor, Sigurd, I give you England. This land already has many rulers. From the cunning King Alfred of Wessex, to the warmongering sons of Ragnar Lothbrok. They have no wish to share the kingdoms they have made their own. I do not fear these men. Nor any others who would harm us. These lands bring our people hope. I will do whatever it takes to make England our home. The Saxons hunger for Norse blood. Let's give them a taste, brothers. These conquests have given you a home, but there is more to this land, Eivor. A darkness unseen, an unknowable threat. One bound to England's destiny. And to yours. Welcome back. In this panel, we're going to be looking at what it is to create a Viking atmosphere, because you can't just have a place kind of look a bit like somewhere. You've got to really, really be able to make it taste and feel to kind of latch us in and really live out that kind of Viking fantasy. So on this panel, we're welcoming back uh, Julian and Darby. Hey, guys. And uh, joining them is Thierry Noel, who's the inspirational content advisor for Ubisoft Paris, and Philippe Bergeron, or Fizz, as he's known, which is the level design director for Ubisoft Montreal, and Raphael Lacoste, who is the art director for Ubisoft Montreal. So welcome, guys. Hi. So um, if we're going to create a Viking atmosphere, I mean, what even, how do you even begin to start answering that question? How do you create the world to give it the kind of taste and feel that it's real? Um. I mean, you've, at first, when you get the, you know, the, the go ahead to do something like this, you just start uh, vacuum up as many resources as possible. You start looking at uh, primary sources like the uh, Anglo-Saxon Chronicle or the Icelandic sagas. You uh, get even like popular media. So you start watching television shows. Um, you watch, uh, and, and I mean, Fizz, I think, found like a lot of the most rare, strange uh, Viking movies that no one had ever uh, heard of. But uh, we'd all kind of pile them together. There's a lot of good television shows out now that we draw from. And uh, we start sorting fact from fiction. You know, the, the, the no horns on helmets thing was uh, important to us right away. But you start getting into all the other details and hopefully by the end of the year you have a good sense of the kind of things you want to uh, um, 
dive into and the kind of subjects you want to bring up. Um, and that actually ultimately led to, after that year of conception, that led to us taking a big trip. Um, to really get into the the, the sights and sounds of uh, of what it meant to be a, a Viking, and I believe we even have uh, some little fun little video from this uh, work excursion. have this approach where we're searching for the subjective you know, aspect of the exploration. So what is uh, my feeling when I'm, I'm in this place? How I feel the scale of the environment? This is the first time I've been on an inspiration trip this far ahead of the actual production that we get to go to a location and really like breathe in the air and get it into our bones before we actually start making the game. Because it's the game is just right here right now. It was so impressive. I didn't expect it to be that big. And I felt like an ant in a world of giants. When we talk about scale, it's trying to put ourselves in the shoes of the people living in this time period. What did they feel when they discovered some place in the Lofoten Islands? It must be incredible. So you have to play with proportions. Uh, you have to play with contrast to make sure that you bring this feeling you have when you are in the real place. We are now about to enter the kingdom of the most wealthiest and powerful chieftain uh, in this area. We are talking about one of the 10 to 15 mightiest and wealthiest and most powerful men in northern Norway. is very interesting because uh, it brings you back uh, in the times and you have a very strong immersion. It's like the fantasy of being in a time machine and being able to, to travel back in time and be, and be there. So raise your glasses. <laughs> Skull! Skull! I think it's great for all the team, for people working on animation, working on sound design, working on environment design, working on clothing, on character design, all this stuff is there. It's also very moving to see all these uh, traces of this culture, these people who were living in this very harsh environment and they were still like uh, very strong and they developed all this very strong culture, belief, and uh, they were e extremely pragmatic to see how they worked, how they, they created the, all this very complex housing, how they created the ships, how they navigated. It's a beautiful package for inspiration. I was really expecting to visit the UK. So for me, the challenge was how can we bring interesting flavor to all these biomes, all this landscape? How can we make this world interesting for the player? In terms of artistic vision, it's a composition of the landscape. All the layers of history, seeing the ruins next to the landscape. We've seen the rolling hills of Mercia, beautiful rolling hills. We really use that as reference. I've never been here before, so this is my first experience. It's a dream I've had since I was a little boy, like five, six years old. Um, and this, this is a blast, like just seeing you know, where Vikings would have trudged and gone through and just getting into that spirit of it is really, really fun. I would like to, like on the quest side, like to try and pull that feeling off, like the first time you get, like what the perception of a Viking would be. So if we can get that, I'd be really, really happy. We have to make like, uh, creative decisions about what we want to bring in the game. What are the iconic elements I want to bring to the game because they are interesting. It's really about creating magical moments in this world using all these iconic places we visit and as inspiration. Visiting a location early in conception and pre-production is interesting because you sort of arrive thinking you know what questions you're going to have answered and then 
new questions and new answers just pop in that you didn't even realize you wanted answered, right? All these moments are going to impact and give us a strong inspiration. We've been watching videos, we've been watching a lot of photos, uh, documentaries, but being there is going to really bring the immersion and I would say the inspiration to the next level. You had so much fun on that trip. I'm so happy for you. The before times were great. Um, <laughs> so what were some of your um, highlights from that trip? Let's start with you, Darby. Um, what's funny is in, in, they, they interviewed me on the very first day they were there. So they're like, hey, what, what's your favorite part of this trip? And I'm like, I just woke up. <laughs> um, but in, in the by the end of the trip, it was definitely the the longhouse experience. We we got to pretend to be the guests of this uh, this Norwegian jarl. Um, we we drank, we ate. Um, there's a bit of the, um, them using a loom and, and weaving a, a blanket there. I I actually got a chance to do at least ten or fifteen lines through that. So my work is, is preserved uh, forever in that in that uh, piece of linen. And it was just a really immersive place. We all came out smelling like smoke, um, and it was three or four hours that I I don't think I could replicate again. It really felt like stepping back in time. Oh, wow. Fizz, how about you? What was your kind of favorite bit from that? Um, I mean, I, I have to agree with Darby. Like that longhouse um, moment was was surreal. But that like that entire day, I remember like the morning of we went open sea fishing with this, this captain. Like we all had these huge parkas uh, on us. It was it was so goddamn cold that day. Um, and then getting to that longhouse at the end of the day where everything was very warm. Um, there was like hot food. Um, we got to change our clothes. We, we actually dressed up in like Viking clothes and whatnot. It, it was amazing. And so that was just very, very comforting to, to finish your day and like it really um, send it in. But Nor Norway as a whole is just like a very magical place where it's surreal. It doesn't feel like if I was to put that in a game, it would look like a caricature. It wouldn't look like a real environment. But w once you get there, you, you have an appreciation for the space that is um, like beyond belief. And I suppose like when you when you think about the 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 like the long houses and stuff like that, where you come back and you think like, oh, but it looks quite basic. You know, you're just sitting in a room. But actually, if you've been out in quite harsh environments, it's like, oh, like I'm back in a place with a fire and there's, you know, yeah. mead and I can change my clothes. And actually, then suddenly the simplest things become like thoroughly exciting it's it's the, the 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 feeling you would get if you go to um for anybody who's gone skiing and the, the chalet like when you go back inside and you you sit in front of the fire and you drink um hot chocolate or whatever it is um like that feeling that you get it's that but magnified by 10 it, it, it's just completely surreal as an experience and raf you look like you were thoroughly inspired by the whole experience tell us about some of your favorite bits uh, I would say um, the Lovelin Islands, uh, the, the part we, we had uh, in Norway was absolutely amazing. And maybe uh, the character trip we did uh, in the fjords, because uh, uh, as Fizz was saying, if you were to create something like this uh, in a concert, for instance, you would have the feeling that uh, you exaggerate. And you see when you're actually in the real place, sometimes nature could be even more over the top and exaggerated than what we can imagine. So this is... Uh, what we like that we really confronted to the scale, the scale of things, the scale of nature, and it really feels unforgiving and impressive. And I think that's something we could bring back to the game because we had this experience, we had this immersion on, on the place. We went also on hikes, uh, we had amazing views, and every single moment we were seeing the landscape were like a, were like a painting from the, you know, the 19th century. So I think that was the inspiration we took from that. And you need to pick also the, the right thing when you, when you come back from the scouting trip you don't pay attention to uh, all the details you had in mind. You pick the right details and you pick also uh, the right inspiration. And so I think that was very important for us to look for credibility, but also picking the right things we want to, to bring in the game after that. 
And I think obviously, you know, we should state that sadly, Julian, you didn't get to go on this trip and you've been sort of yeah, got this kind of look of FOMO about you. Um, but um, obviously, you know, the, the kind of core things that you would think you'd need to know about, oh, we're going to make a game about Vikings, you know, it'd be like, oh, yeah, using shields and, you know, firing bows and kind of just all that kind of focus on warfare, which is, of course, important. But like, how important is that kind of getting a sense and understanding of just the kind of, I don't want to say the drudgery of day-to-day -day life, but it's a bit like that. The kind of things that you would repeatedly sort of do and would be part, and you know, that we all do, that are just very, very particular to the world and the time that we live in. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't get to go to the wonderful scouting trip. My daughter was starting daycare on that week, and I decided to stay with her, obviously. Uh, and the, the thing is, is that, you know, they made a beautiful book of the trip, and it's sitting on my desk. And every single morning when I log in my computer, I see that book and remind me, I'm reminded that I wasn't there. That you didn't and go. That beautiful... Everyone had a lovely time without me. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it was it possible? I wasn't even there. But um, uh, no, for, for when, obviously, I, I participated in the whole planning of the trip. And, and for me, it was really important to make sure that we didn't, uh, you know, only did it like a classic historical research trip that we had this opportunity with Vikings to kind of be kind of walking a bit down the path that the Viking took and make the, the this trip a bit more physical and grounded and real. And that's why, you know, they did a bunch of activities to try to, to pretend for a day or two that they were Vikings. And that was important because um, there is something very visceral about the fantasy that we're, that we're making. And I think the trip was was very successful uh, on that on that regard. Definitely successful in raising my FOMO to, you know, unseen levels before. So that's <laughs> that, that was a success. That was uh, the important thing that, for uh, you to be sad. Take, take, <laughs> <laughs> but the takeaway we got from that trip, especially yeah. that we did it a bit later down in conception, um, we had mm. the opportunity to validate and experience things when part of the research was already done. And I think that was that was pretty cool and uh, and very useful for for the team. I mean, Thierry, what did you what did you think was some of the best kind of information and, and, and stuff that sort of came out of the game from that trip, do you think? Oh, I think there was, there was a lot of them I mean, from uh, all we did, all those uh, immersive experiences, which was not obvious. It was quite a challenge, I mean, to, to find something to do that could be immersive and when there is nothing left. But uh, to my point of view, I think that uh, all those uh, everyday little things and that uh, everything is valuable, everything counts. I uh, remember us uh, making bread. I uh, remember us uh, t trying to, to make rope, realizing that uh, every bit of, uh, of rope of wood is valuable, and that you, you have to take care of it. And uh, I think this came back to the to the game as uh, with the idea of resources of the importance of of taking care of everything around you and did you um, did you actually find that any of the art direction changed post trip was did was there a shift do you think in actually the the look of the game in some regards after after being on that kind of trip yes that's a good question actually uh, i think by being there and uh, really immersed in uh, england but also in norway uh, we learn how to move away from the cliche and I think that was very interesting for us because um, if we look at the reference, uh, very often we go for very desaturated uh, landscapes. Uh, you see Vikings in mud uh, with, uh, you know, blue uniforms and, and, and uh, leather with like, heavy stitches. But you, you realize that when, when you, you do your homework and when you go on the place, you realize that it was actually a colorful world. It was not only desaturated and people were spending time engraving wood and making beautiful uh, crafting on the ships and decorations on the, even the foreheads. So uh, I think the visual direction of the game really changed based on that. Also seeing just details like uh, the light flickering be between the branches of oak tree, all these kind of magical moments we had uh, through the journey was a fantastic inspiration for the team. And I would say really to move away of also from the cliche of the representation of the Vikings. So on this trip, you actually kind of followed the, the beats of the game uh, in a lot of regard because you sort of went from Norway and came down to England. And obviously, that's quite a shocking difference in terms of, you know, culture and uh, what it looks like. And, and this was your uh, first time in all of these places. So you've probably taken more aback than uh, anyone else. What was kind of some of the insights that you gleaned from it? 
Um, it, it was it was very impressive and very uh, um, humbling uh, of an experience. Where so first thing you get off the airplane in Norway and you, you're we're heading towards um, one of the locations uh, in on in a fjord and you're taken aback by the like the verticality of the mountains. Everything is very steep, rough rock. Um, it's a harsh environment. Um, everything is much bigger than um, any expectations you might have, and all of civilization happens at the water level. There, you, you literally only have people living next to the water at the base of the mountains, and then it's nothing. It's just sheer rock walls. So it, it is, you can imagine where the, the, the image of like, this giants built this, gods built these things, right? That That's the image that you have in your head um, as you're going through Norway. And then fast forward a week later, we get on a plane, we land in England, and the first thing you see is lush, rolling hills filled with vegetation it was actually warm uh bizarrely for england it was nice and hot wow, that's an unusual sunny. experience yeah <laughs> I, the, the stereotype we've all heard was like very rainy um <laughs> but it was actually really warm there um and and inviting so it, it was easy to put yourself in in the the, the, the boots of a Viking, like coming to England, um, sailing up the, the, the rivers in England, and then sealing, seeing these inviting hills just ripe for the taking, filled with opportunities. Um, so it, it is a very, very, very stark contrast from one country to the next. I mean, and imagine as well, we have a rough idea what places look like because we have access to the internet or books or, you know, things like that. But imagine, you know, getting on a boat and being like, I actually know nothing about this place. Um, you know, I mean, having sort of done that yourself, what do you think, you know, what do you think the Vikings would have thought when they turned up in England after coming coming from Norway? It's pretty shocking. Darby, what do you reckon? Well, the, there was a, the, there's a lot of sheep. That's what they would think. Um <laughs> The uh, we I remember we actually we actually came back from the trip. We're like we're doing sheep, right? That has to be in the game because they're everywhere. Um, <laughs> uh, there was a there was a moment that we were actually sailing around um, and uh, on some rivers, and we just we just you, you felt even though you were in a boat and it was a and it was river and it was quite open. There was forest on both sides, and you could really feel like. Uh, you really felt sneaky. You were like sneaking up a river and you might land somewhere and then jump off the boat really quickly, run in, smash a few heads, grab some stuff, jump on that boat and then sail away. Um, and it was, it was really like when we were on the rivers of England um, that, that I really started to feel like what it must have felt like to be this invader in this land um, and, and to, and to get that sense that, Maybe people were afraid that there was a you know a Viking longboat lurking around the bend or something. Uh, that was that, that brought it home pretty well. And what would you say? Are kind of obviously, you know, there is that kind of verticality in the, the huge scale of like Norway. But were there kind of some magical moments when you when you came to England, like places that were particularly uh, exciting or uh, you know in, invigorating to look at? Do you think Hadrian's Wall was definitely amazing? Um, seeing the Roman ruins. And then we also went to Lindisfarne, which is the place in England that kicked off the Viking Age. It was an old monastery, and that was where the first Viking attack in England happened. Those two places oh, wow. really started to uh, give us inspiration. Uh, the other guys will have other ideas. Yes, I wanted to jump in and talk about uh, this uh, sunrise on Ravenscar. It was pretty incredible. And actually, when we saw the seals, the very cute seals, we wanted also to have them in the game. And yeah, actually, we, we had a plan first to, to go to a few museums and uh, we changed a bit the, the, the plans and go sideways and did, did a bit of uh, hiking. And I think the hikes we, we did uh, were like also very inspiring. And as uh, Fizz was talking about, the contrast between the, the harsh landscape of Norway and the variety of England was something that was extremely important to bring in the game as well, because we, we want the player to have this kind of uh, mental map of the world, to, to, to have this, all these feet of change will really play a very important role to uh, anchor the narrative with the visual direction of, uh, of a territory, for instance. And you can really see where you are in the game and remember where, where you went through. So we went to, to Peak District, went to Puzzle, to different locations, the Dean Forest. And all these locations had like, a very interesting, you know, vibrant uh, color palette, but also visual composition. It was almost like a natural landmark. And as you know, in this age, we don't have that many man-made landmarks, and we wanted to to compensate with the natural locations and natural landmarks in the game. 
Well, I've got a bit of FOMO now about your trip. I'm not going to lie. Me and Juliana are now in the uh, in the same boat, as it were. Um, I, I think I'd like to wrap up this particular session just by uh, asking a very quick question in just sort of one sentence. Uh, what would you say Viking atmosphere means to you? We'll start with you, Fizz. For me, for me, it's it's an atmosphere of contrast. It's uh, by day, I am a I am a Viking warrior. I go out, I I pillage, I fight, uh, I get sweaty, uh, I get dirty, and I can And then I come home, and it's a life of contemplation. It's a life of beauty. Uh, it's a life of family, of warmth uh, with my family uh, and my friends. And so it, it's constant contrast like that. There, there's a poetry to these people that is unexpected. Um, and for me, that's that's the the main takeaway I, I took from this trip. And then maybe, you know, Julian, as you are, you know, sadly didn't get to go on the trip, you can be a little bit more objective about uh, what you think uh, Viking atmosphere is all about. Yeah, by the way, I, I would rate my FOMO level now at 9.5. Thank you for asking. It's fairly high, I would say, <laughs> after all these wonderful, uh, you know, uh, kind of remembrance about all of the trip. Uh, but uh, for for me, the uh, the Viking atmosphere has to be mystical. Um, it's uh, when the, the line between mythology and re reality is constantly blurred, um, you know, the, the from the majestic of the locations and the sites of Norway to even in England with, with Stonehenge and all those, those moments, you know, London was built on top of Roman ruins. Uh, the people at the time thought they were built by giants. Um, and there is this constant feeling of, of mysticism and mysticality um, that for, for me is really, really uh, key to the kind of the, the Viking flavor that we want to have in the game. I suppose one final big question is just, you know, um, you know, are you guys going to take Julian on another little trip when, when you're allowed outside the house again? Because I feel quite sad for him that he missed it all. <laughs> if he asks, nice. You might just go camping up yeah. in the Laurentians if you want. <laughs> <laughs> That's about as glamorous as it's going to get. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, look, thank you so, so much, guys, uh, for uh, sharing a Thanks. little bit uh, about how you kind of you, you've given that kind of deep, uh, deep Viking flavor uh, to the game. Uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes. I can see your fate. It flows like a river, carved out before you. I can see your desires, taking you far from your home, to lands of power, of mystics and legends. But you are hiding something. You walk with shadows. What is it you seek? I see conquest. I see your enemies. Your struggles. Your doubts. Glory awaits you, Eivor. But it will cost you. All of it. Blood and flame. Loyalty and family. Betrayal. Hunger. There is a war within you. And glory will not be enough. This 
is a time of conquest. The age of Vikings. In Assassin's Creed Valhalla, you play as Eivor, the fierce Viking warchief of the Raven Clan. Eivor and their kin have forged into England to settle the new frontiers. But these are dangerous times, and each new landscape contains untold perils and mysteries to uncover. Your saga begins with a simple need for a home. Your Viking settlement is the beating heart of your adventure and is the intersecting point for many of Valhalla's interwoven storylines. Here, you'll get familiar with your clan and begin your journey through England. At the Alliance map, you'll meet Randvi, the clan's key intel gatherer, and plan your first moves. Eivor, Sigurd, I give you England and its four kingdoms, Mercia, East Anglia, Northumbria, and Wessex. By forging alliances with different territories, the Raven Clan will expand their influence, allowing you to grow your settlement and open a wealth of new narrative arcs, missions, activities, and ways to experience the game world. Let's go. It's time to capture a kingdom. Each of England's kingdoms have many stories to uncover, with their own unique plot lines casts of characters, and challenges to overcome. Are you Sigurd Dranger? Eivor. If you keep that up, I'll stay in the floors. Including assassinating targets, forging allies, and assaulting rivals in large-scale battles. These story arcs explore the themes of honor, glory, leadership and choice that are central to Eivor's journey. And your pivotal choices will leave long-lasting impacts across the kingdoms. Three men, three possible futures. Who will serve us best in a time of true need? Viking warfare is visceral and brutal. And there are many powerful rivals and enemy types that will stand in your way. Thankfully, Eivor is equipped with a diverse set of combat skills, including brute strength charging maneuvers, close quarters melee attacks, and explosive two-handed finishes, while range abilities like Man's Best Friend and Poison Powder Trap allow you to flank and interrupt your foes from a distance. Your skills are upgraded through a progression system, which allows you to unlock perks and abilities to suit your style of play. Special abilities are found in books of knowledge hidden throughout the world and have their own upgrade tiers that improve their power and effectiveness. As you forge deeper on your journey, your explorations will reward you with exotic gear from the far corners of the world, further unlocking combat options and dual wield combinations, including the legendary Excalibur. Choice is central to Valhalla's player experience, and that begins with Eivor. At the start of your adventure, you'll have the opportunity to choose Eivor's gender, and you can seamlessly swap between male and female Eivor at any time during your story. And so I race my horn to the Raven Clan, the best of friends and fighters. After a victory, you return home with resources pillaged from your conquests using them to expand your settlement with structures and upgrades. There's a wide variety of structures to build, each with their own unique gameplay systems and perks. The barracks allow you to elect a Jomsviking, which is a powerful Viking lieutenant, and build a custom crew of raiders to ride with, which are shared with your friends online. Gunnar the blacksmith enhances weapons and gear, and at the tattooist, you'll customize Eivor's look at the shipyard, Gudrun and Goodmund will customize and improve your longship. And in the Hidden Ones Bureau, you will work from the shadows, embroiling yourself in a mysterious conflict with the Order of the Ancients. We have work to do, starting in the cities of England. Our task will not be an easy one. 
These are just a few examples, and there's plenty more fun to be had around your settlement. Drink your weight in ale, play a game of Orlog, or throw a massive Viking feast. However, growth comes with its own set of dangers, and your settlement will become the target of new enemy factions. A septic rot has overtaken this shire. <laughs> Valhalla's world is built for a wandering spirit. You'll uncover deeper layers to Eivor's own story in a set of dramatic and intimate narrative through lines. I lost my parents when I was nine winters along. Without Sigurd, I would have. There is always one unbreakable bond. Yes. Player choice is woven through every facet of the game experience. And as you continue to explore, you'll uncover new stories and epiphanies in the most unlikely places. Drink, if you seek true understanding. But this world is just the beginning. Balka, the clan seer, will unlock your senses, allowing you to leap beyond. To Asgard, the legendary realm of Norse myth. From Norway to England, to new worlds, Assassin's Creed Valhalla allows you to experience your own elemental Viking saga. The thrill of discovery, the glory of victory, and the light of kinship. A journey beyond kingdoms and into the soul of a warrior. You intrigue me, Wolfkist. Orphan and sibling, Warrior and poet, you are many in one, it seems. Hey, Vod! Sigurd! <laughs> I missed you, brother. Ramti, your husband returns, bringing gifts and riches to share. And new friends, I see. We cannot stay in Norway, not without fueling more war. So we push forward. A new kingdom awaits. From here to Valhalla, I will always be on your side, Sigurd. Always. Eivor, Sigurd, I give you England. This land already has many rulers. From the cunning King Alfred of Wessex, to the warmongering sons of Ragnar Lothbrok. They have no wish to share the kingdoms they have made their own. I do not fear these men. Nor any others who would harm us. These lands bring our people hope. I will do whatever it takes to make England our home. The Saxons hunger for Norse blood. Let's give them a taste, brothers. These conquests have given you a home, but there is more to this land, Eivor. A darkness unseen, an unknowable threat. One bound to England's destiny and to yours. The Assassin's Creed games love to kind of consume and cover themselves within the history of the era that they've chosen to represent. And Assassin's Creed Valhalla is no different at all. In fact, we thought we'd pull together some of the great minds that they have leaned upon to kind of make this universe as exciting as it can be. And I mean, you know, you're going to be spending hundreds and hundreds of hours as you usually do. So joining us in this panel is Thierry Noel, who's the inspirational content advisor for Ubisoft Paris. We have Lucy Malbos, who is professor at the University of Poitiers. We have Ryan Novell, who's professor at the University of Winchester. We have Darby McDevitt, who's the narrative director at Ubisoft Montreal. And Raphael Lacoste, art director at Ubisoft Montreal. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Oh, good, thanks. Yeah. 
Hello. Excellent. Okay, before we kind of get into exactly kind of what kind of, you know, historical documents and facts you kind of drew upon to, you know, recreate this uh, part of history, I just really from just more like a personal point of view, do you ever start off your research on Wikipedia like normal people? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Come on, be honest. Oh. You do. Yeah, we it's we, we 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 pull up an entry and then we we go right to the bottom where all the actual sources are. So, so <laughs> Wikipedia is like an appetizer, but you you got to go to the main course uh, quickly. Oh, we we oh, okay. spent months beating it out of our students to uh, <laughs> doing that. So I couldn't possibly comment on that uh, that issue. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, Darby's right. The there are references, and you know, going going to the references is something which which is uh, helpful and you have to then go to the references to to do so yeah so i mean obviously um within the game we're going to be seeing some incredibly you know recreated historical uh, settlements so when you're kind of going about building that part of the world what kind of um you know historical resources can you actually use for that well i think one important thing to know before, before all uh, about uh, the Valhalla setting, it's I think of all the periods we we dealt with in a, we dealt with in a, in Assassin's Creed, it is possibly the one that has less documentation. I mean, uh, we had too many uh, documentation uh, with origins or Odyssey, but there's very very few documents for uh, and sources for uh, for Valhalla. Uh, well, we have uh, chronicles. We have uh, sagas, we have uh, archaeological documents, but as I say, it's very few at, uh, at the end. Uh, so, so you have, in any fo anyway, you, you end up and you have to speak with uh, experts such as uh, Lucy or, or Ryan to, to know more about the period. But surely it's quite good that there are gaps because then you can kind of sneak your own little, little artistic interpretation mm -hmm. in, no? It's very, very helpful. <clears throat> One of the big things that we noticed in this game was like, for instance, the guy, King Harold Fairhair, um, there's a 30 year gap or a 30 year span where they think a certain battle took place. And when you have 30 years to move a story beat around, that's very, very helpful. <laughs> You're like, Dobby's like, yes, this is great. There are so many gaps. <laughs> yeah, he's either 30 or 60. We just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so much room for possibility. Um, I mean, you know, Ryan, is this kind of similar for in terms of historians, like where there are these kind of like gaps? Is it is it a similar kind of thing? You have to kind of fill things in as best you can. Sure. I mean, it's uh, partly a, a sort of aspect of uh, suggesting alternative possibilities and, and then trying to hook frameworks around that for uh, historical events. And that is that is where a lot of the fun can be had in, in saying, you know, if, if somebody died in a particular year, what, what might the consequences be uh, for that? So, you know, I, I totally appreciate that, that sort of, you know, the the desire to sort of fit things into the uh, the, the gaps between the, the known evidence. Because sometimes all we know is a name and a date and, you know, if we're lucky, a place associated with them. And then uh, these these guys are, are thinking about, you know, constructing whole worlds around these, these people and, and potentially fleshing them out. Now, I know you guys worked with Jean-Claude uh, Golvin. I'm going to say that right. Golvin is probably the better way of saying it instead of the way I say it. Uh, yes. So, for, uh, I mean, there's quite a few people out there who perhaps might not know uh, of his work. Um, Raf, you work quite, uh, quite close with him. Do you want to sort of explain how that relationship worked and how it affected the game? So, yeah, what is special about uh, Jean-Claude Golvin is that he is an historian, researcher, but also is a very talented illustrator and uh, watercolor painter. So uh, we got a chance to, look, to work with him back in the days on Origins. Uh, he was uh, helping us to bring to life the different cities, the different locations and villages. And we had a chance to work with him again on Valhalla, uh, on the different cities and different settlements we have in uh, the, the world game. So what kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, information was he kind of creating and, and drawing to inspire you? What sort of things that can we see? Uh, so... You know, it's not uh, like you're making a film, making a game. Uh, we, we need to start from the blank page. And when we start from the blank page, we need to bring to life all these locations with a very credible approach. Um, you know, and when it's starting, you know, really from the terrain, the different biomes and the different locations, it's a, it's a big challenge for the team. 
So being able to work with someone like Jean-Claude Galvin is a, a lot of problem solving. We can really find inspiration to design the different roles, connecting to different locations, um, find a very interesting variety of uh, you know, cultural clash, because we know we have this very interesting of layer of history in, in England. We have all these Roman ruins mixed with the different Saxon buildings. And I think the contrast and the cultural clash we can bring to life in this game is also very interesting to explore. And I, uh, the approach we had with Jean-Claude Volvin was, was the first iteration we made when we built the, the World of Valhalla. We actually used um, some maps as well as sort of like a kind of central um, sort of starting point. So um, how did they kind of factor in? So, yeah, as I was saying, we start from the blank page. The, the map is like mm. the first thing we have to inspire the team. Mm. So we have these maps to give the sense of scale, but also to see how we can connect the different locations with the landscape around and where we have different cultures, different zones for the agricultural aspect of the, of the game. So the, the transition between the, the, the beauty of the nature, but also the, the areas that are more like used and work with all the agricultural setting, then connecting to different locations was already planned through these maps. So that, uh, that was very interesting for us. So Ryan, I mean, obviously we have, um, you know, kind of you know, maps as a kind of sort of like primary uh, source, but then, you know, as a historian, uh, what else do you kind of have to go on when you're kind of um, trying to figure out how these settlements worked and how they sort of, um, you know, work together as like a whole? Yeah, in England, we have uh, some really useful documents. Uh, there, there is Doomsday Book from the late 11th century, so just in the, the wake of the Norman conquest of, of England, where there is this, this survey of every village, every settlement uh, in, in the English kingdom and how big they are, how many families are, are working on that and uh, what the, you kind of get an impression of the sizes of the fields uh, of, of these places. So this, this stretches across from the, the area of Wessex in the south where I am to uh, the areas settled in the uh, settled by the Vikings, the area known as the the Dane Law. So there are there's differences, some some differences in in terms of the uh, the scale of the settlements, uh, for example, um, that that can be seen through through Doomsday Book. And um, a, th a thing I, that I really like actually from the Anglo-Saxon period is the charters, these these little land documents where uh, they are they documents which are are given for the title of a land, of a piece of land. And they've, they've actually got these little verbal maps on them where they, they tell you to go from one point to another, from the old tree to the stream, and then cross at the old ford and things like that, giving you the boundaries of the, uh, the place. So there's the language um, of the time of, is, is kind of tied in with the landscape. So, you know, we, we, have, we have a fair bit to go on in, in, um, in early medieval England. I like that. That's really fun. Turn left at the tree, go 12 paces right towards the sunset. I don't know. It sounds a bit like a treasure map, really, to me. Um, but you also had um, you guys had some really uh, interesting and beautiful um, uh, art as well, I think, from uh, Lincoln that we can take a look at. Just just talk us through a little bit about this, you know, this particular area. So it's, it's very interesting to have uh, this extrusion of the map to... Uh, an inspiring, you know, illustration. So that's what we, we are working on the second stage with the illustrator on the game. So we start first with the, with the maps, all these different plans of the different cities. And then we try to give uh, a, a new life to this location through also the, the, I would say the artistic filter, because we want to bring emotion to the player. This is where we, we took uh, this kind of romantic filter on uh, the visual direction of this game. Uh, we like to have this kind of uh, emphasis of uh, the beauty of nature, but also of the feelings. And I think emotion is very important. So we don't want to have some, something that is too rational when we create a place. We want to have something that is interesting to explore, but also can really uh, bring something interesting to the exploration loop as well. So making sure that we have these different landmarks that could be through a natural element in the game, in the world, but also some you know, attracting elements like a tower in the distance or a steeple. Um, these kind of things we need to, to, to have in the exploration loop, but also to bring interesting moments of emotion in the world. So there are some fantastic locations within the game that we're going to be going to. And obviously, you know, a lot of these are inspired by real world locations. And there are some incredible places out there. I suppose we should probably start off um, with Stonehenge. I mean, I don't think you can sort of get away with not uh, doing that. So I think, Ryan, you're on a little bit of a journey to Stonehenge with the team. 
Yes, yeah, it was the when I, when I met the team, they they were on their uh, the last leg of their tour of uh, inspirational locations, and uh, I I went uh, I went up to Stonehenge where they were, you know, all these all these people with you know sort of looking around it, it's slightly more intently than your average tourist does, and uh, it's sort of getting <laughs> getting really engaged with the. The measuring moss. The place. <laughs> measuring moss and, <laughs> yeah. and looking at the area around and, and things like that. And Stonehenge, you know, Stonehenge is a much older location than the uh, the Saxon period, but it's it's there to the um to the Saxons. It's it's there as you know, the the place the, the place name is is old English and uh, it's you know, with these, mm. these hanging stones as the, the the kind of meaning there. And it's it's got this this kind of link in with the uh, the the people of the time, so I I thought it's you know a, a great evocative yeah. location for them to have, have chosen, and they're asking me all sorts of questions about you know how would how would the Vikings <laughs> have thought about it, how would the Saxons have thought about it, and uh, so it was you know I was I was in at the deep end really with you know being being shuttled back and forth between all these <laughs> uh, these folks there. Um, uh, Raf, so I mean, we've also got some images here from, you know, uh, Norway, and we're kind of seeing some comparisons between, you know, uh, real life Norway and kind of how it's presented the game. And I think, obviously, one of the biggest things as well is um, the Northern Lights, which is something that, you know, you've taken a little romantic lens, rose tinted glasses to the world, and kind of <laughs> shone them over this as well, right? Yes, for sure. But you know what, when we got a chance to, uh, to go to Norway during the scouting trip, we had this amazing show of uh, the Northern Light. We were very lucky to be that right at a good moment. And when we saw that, it was even more impressive in real. So sometimes, you know, nature can be even more impressive than the reinterpretation we can make in illustration or even in the game. So uh, that's for sure. We, we, we worked on the filters. We worked on, on the, the, the color correction to make sure that it's very memorable and very bold in the game. And we also make sure that it's happening every night. So if the player just spend a few hours in the game, he will get the chance to see the Northern Lights. Well, you know, some people go on holidays to go and see the Northern Lights and they spend a lot of money and then it just doesn't happen. So you're doing a service, exactly. I feel, for, <laughs> for, feel for people there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the um, other locations money. we're going to take it. Yeah, take a look at is um, Stave Church. Now, this is an incredibly uh, impressive location. Um, Lucy, can you just tell us just a, just a little bit about what this location is? Uh, this location maybe is yours in Norway. It's one of the most fantastic stave church we have. Stave church are wooden uh, churches with a lot of wood carvings. And they are very iconic buildings from Scandinavia. But they are Christian buildings, first of all. So there is here a recreation, I think, in the game, because in the game it's no longer a Christian building. But maybe it was more impressive that just a great hall uh, because it's bigger, it's higher, and there are lots of uh, wood carvings, very beautiful ones. We actually have some incredible uh, you know, natural locations within the game, such as the Forest of Dean and Seven Sisters as well. And uh, obviously you can see, I mean, they look spectacular just normally, but then they do have that kind of extra video game zhuzh added to them. Um, Thierry, how did you pick which kind of natural locations you were going to include in the game? Oh yes, absolutely. Huh? We, we didn't want only human creations, and uh, so we we looked for uh, natural, beautiful places. And I think in England, if you want some magical place location, it's uh, definitely the the forest of Dean. It's an ancient uh, primary forest that was obviously present at the moment uh, of our Viking, and we did uh, we spent uh, an evening there during the field trip. And it's absolutely amazing. I mean, it's a magical place with full of legends. You can imagine everything in there. And as always, it's also a place that has been visited by Romans because uh, our players may be surprised by the, the presence of uh, so many uh, Roman ruins in the game. But the fact is that England was full and still. It's uh, full of, uh, of Roman ruins and uh, pretty well conserved, actually. And Darby, this must make you know, in terms of um, in terms of the narrative, in terms of the story, it, it, you know, having these kind of like incredible locations must kind of really help facilitate you thinking, like uh, you know, and, and being inspired to kind of you know write big, exciting stories within the game. 
Right. I mean, uh, we t- we often talk about the sediment of history and the like a seven layer dip of English history. And and when you go from, you know, the Stonehenge and all the people that, uh, the, that built that to the Britons, the pagans who lived there around the time of the Roman invasion, the Romans themselves, um, then the Anglo-Saxons, uh, pagan first, then Christian, and then the Vikings on top of it. We have all these layers we want to uh, to play with, and we we use different uh, territories in the game to bring those stories to light. So if we're talking about the Forest of Dean, um, the particular story we tell down in that quadrant or section of the of England is really evocative of the uh, of the pagan Britons, the the people that lived there um, prior to the Anglo-Saxon uh, invasion. Um, and so we delve into the sort of pagan roots and mysticism of, of old, old England. Um, and we do that all over the game, wherever, wherever, like we can kind of pull on history, we'll, uh, we'll bring it to life. Obviously, you know, this period of time has a lot of kind of holes within the story a little bit, just through there not being, you know, a, a lot of information that you can actually glean. Um, so I, I presume you guys used uh, sagas, which were like a big kind of uh, inspiration to sort of, you know, just even just to sort of give you a kind of you know, a jumping off point of where, you know, you could potentially fit other things in. Um, but what I wanted to ask was um, to, to Lucy was about the sagas themselves. Can you explain a little bit about sort of uh, what they are and, and how they're kind of uh, framed and kind of looked at and, and divided? Well, uh, yes, sagas are a very, uh, very important source of information for the for Scandinavia. But you have uh, different kinds of sagas. You have historical ones and legendary ones. Um, but all other were wide, were written later, centuries later, and in a Christian world. So it's very different from the Viking Age. Uh, in historical sagas, you have uh, very important uh, figures, kings and chiefs, like uh, Harold Finher. Uh, Harold fin- Fairhair is um, an important king from Norway, the king of the unification of Norway, uh, the first one, because it's a very long process. But we don't have so much details about Harald Fairhair. Uh, there are huge gaps. It's a, a heroical figure, and we have to, to do with uh, some information and a lot of gaps of uh, element missing. So, I mean, Darby, you know, Harold actually features sort of quite uh, sort of prominently. It was an important character kind of within the game. So how did you kind of like sneak in all the extra bits to kind of like flesh out the story if there are these gaps. Yeah, um, as was mentioned, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to pin down um, exact dates, exact events uh, in history, especially when you're dealing with the sagas. They're, they're really in, incredible adventure stories often, but they can't be relied on for um, historical accuracy. Um, uh, but they're inspiring as a storyteller. So we, we took the, the beginning of our game, sort of the prologue, if you will, set in Norway. We used the ascendance of Harold uh, Fairhair to uh, really jumpstart the narrative. And because so little is known about him, um, we could do whatever we wanted with him. We tried to stay very, very credible. Uh, he's a very young guy at the time, um, but he's a very talented guy. And he kind of is the one who inspires a lot of... Uh, people to the, it's leave Norway. <laughs> yeah, that's the polite way of saying it. Um, and that really kicks off uh, our, the, the rest of our journey. And we use sagas in this way all over, uh, uh, all over. There's also, we've, we've talked about, we're going to Vinland, which is North America. Um, we also kind of draw, drew from the Vinland sagas as well, which are two small documents that um, tell the story of the Vikings, uh, um, uh, having a little 10 year visit to North America. So all these sources are, are, are great um, starting points for us. Um, even the structure and the format of the sagas as kind of an episodic uh, um, stories, rather than what we're used to, these um, sort of arcs of redemption, three act structure, which we are, you know, make up most of our movies today. We use the sagas as these more long form stories where you talk about extended periods of time, people's lives unfolding, families, you know, growing up and getting older. Um, so it was really inspiring for us. And, and they're, they're really fun, interesting pieces of literature that uh, not enough people read, I think, 
um, but they should. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, we've touched upon in this in this particular panel, you know, about kind of like the settlements and the landscapes and, you know, the kind of inspiration in terms of sort of narrative. But it wasn't just kind of all about that. I mean, to obviously have like a kind of fully realised world and characters, it has to come down to like what they believe in and like how they how they think. So what kind of historical documentation, if there was any, do you kind of use to kind of pull in that information? Uh, well, I'll briefly talk about maybe uh, um, someone else can illuminate it better, but they, we use the, uh, what are called the poetic edda um, and the prose edda. Um, these are the kind of uh, more uh, mythological centered uh, documents. Um, and they tell, this is, it's through the eddas that we know most of what we know, or that we've learned most of what we know about the, the gods and, you know, all the mythological realms like Odin and Thor and Freya and things. Um, but they too served as an inspiration for our myth world elements. Um, but the exact like nature of these documents is also very historically uh, um, difficult. Really? Okay. I mean, Lucy, is there anything that you could potentially expand on sort of what people kind of think and, uh, and, and feel about these Eddas? Yeah, the Eddas are very difficult to use for an historian to know, uh, to know better the Viking world because they were written later, centuries later, in the 13th century and in a Christian world. So they are talking about pagan world in the 9th or 10th century, but uh, with a very, very important gap in time and also in mentalities. Oh, wow. if, we relied, if we relied solely on what the Vikings wrote, you'd, you'd have like maybe like 10 pages of stuff because there's it's just like etchings, <laughs> etchings on rocks in runes yeah. or etchings on pieces of bark, and that's about all. So we have to use these Christian sources from a few hundred years later to get any yeah. sort of long form story. If we didn't, we wouldn't have anything. But there's a lot of fun to be had in, in thinking about how they, you know, what, what is kind of known from the, the editors, how that can be sort of looked back on uh, with regard to archaeology, with regard to uh, sculptures, little objects, little votive objects that are sort of placed in holy places and, and things like that. So that, you know, there are, there are indications that what we have in the Eddas is a, a reflection of part of a belief system uh, that was uh, that, that was seen and, and understood in the Viking Age. Um, well, I think I, we could go way, way more into this as with all of these uh, panels, but I think we've actually kind of run out of time for this one. So I just wanted to say a big, big thank you to uh, all of our panelists. And uh, we're just going to wait for a short break and we'll be back in a few minutes. You intrigue me, Wolfkist. Orphan and sibling, warrior and poet. You are many in one, it seems. Hey, boy! See you good! <laughs> I missed you, brother. Ramdi, your husband returns, bringing gifts and riches to share. And new friends, I see. We cannot stay in Norway, not without fueling more war. So we push forward. A new kingdom awaits. From here to Valhalla, I will always be on your side, Sigurd. Always. Sigurd, I give you England. This land already has many rulers. From the cunning King Alfred of Wessex to the warmongering sons of Ragnar Lothbrok, they have no wish to share the kingdoms they have made their own. I do not fear these men. nor any others who would harm us. These lands bring our people hope. I will do whatever it takes to make England our home. The Saxons hunger for Norse blood. Let's give them a taste, brothers. The 
These conquests have given you a home, but there is more to this land, Eivor. A darkness unseen, an unknowable threat. One bound to England's destiny, and to yours. I can see your fate. It flows like a river, carved out before you. I can see your desires, taking you far from your home, to lands of power, of mystics, and legends. But you are hiding something. You walk with shadows. What is it you seek? I see conquest. I see your enemies. Your struggles. Your doubts. Glory awaits you, Eivor. But it will cost you. See all of it. Blood and flame. Loyalty and family. Betrayal. Hunger. There is a war within you. And glory will not be enough. Welcome back to our next panel, which is all about the popularity of Vikings, because we all know that Vikings are just so hot right now. Mm -hmm. And some people who know that for a fact uh, are Cecilia Magnus, Julian Ryan and Einar, who are joining us now. Hi, guys. How are you doing? I Still good. doing good. Good, good. good. Thank you. So much. Uh, very good. Thank you. Everyone's getting good at the little little wave. High five. It's cool. Um, <laughs> so I suppose we should probably start off with why are people so fascinated with Vikings? What is the allure of the Vikings that like sucks people in? Julian, what do you think? Well, for us, um, when we start to look at the Vikings and you know in the popular culture and you know what's the what's the vibe of Vikings basically, and for us, Vikings are like superhumans. You know, like Vikings come from the north. Uh, you know, they're badass warriors. They had those, you know, those ships that no one has seen before. And they just kind of almost like from another planet, you know, they're superhumans and they, they kind of rule their era. And, and for us, it is, it's something very powerful to latch on, you know, because it kind of translates very well in a, in a strong player fantasy that we wanted for our game. So, so for us, Vikings are definitely superhumans, you know, and we kind of, want to go full on with with that sort of vibe which is really cool um ryan i mean you must probably be able to uh to tell us a little bit about but just purely by what questions probably you know people ask you what is it that people are fascinated about that era yeah well it's that uh that that sort of sense of superhuman i i think is is i mean admittedly that is a, a bit of a stereotype sometimes and uh, <laughs> i i I suspect the Vikings aren't all, you know, sort of built like some of the uh, the characters there. Um, but there is that that sort of element of, wow, here's this this sort of group of people from the north who are a connective tissue amongst all the the different uh, different places, the different peoples uh, across the early medieval world, the Viking Age, and the you know the ships, the movements, the uh, there is a sense of adventure. I think it it, it is one of the mm. things. It's it's one of the things that draws people to the the, the period that I I work on, uh, and it's it's often that that sort of that first 
port of call in in many ways for for people and uh yeah. you know this this kind of um this this kind of mixture of of fantasy and and historical and historical and archaeological reality you know all these all this this kind of blend is it's quite exciting really I mean, Julianne, obviously there are, I mean, you know, obviously there is evidence, but, you know, there are quite a, quite a large number of kind of gaps within that period as well. I mean, um, how do you then, I, mean, I suppose that's quite good if you're making a game. It gives you a bit of freedom for a kind of uh, artistic license to sort of like fill in the gaps. No one's going to correct you. <laughs> yeah, on, on, on Assassin's Creed, we just love those gaps, you know, like when history is <laughs> super them. precise, we kind of, you know, we prefer to have those those big gaps. And, and uh, you know, the, the Norse had a very uh, much of a oral tradition, and most of what's written were written by the Saxons. So that gives a lot of, uh, of interesting gaps to fill with our own stories and so on. So we just love when there's two things that we love on Assassin's Creed whenever there is conflict and political intrigue and when there's gaps in history. And I think this, this period of time has both. And we just, we just love it because we can come up with our, our own characters and our own stories. And in Vikings, in a way, we're, we're already blurring the line between, you know, like a, a folklore and reality with the way their society was, was, was together and so on. So it's, it's, it's a very, very cool time period to make a game in. Uh, because we get so much agency as as game developers in it, so we're no, we were we were super uh, super happy with with having that period to kind of create uh, create our our own things. So it was really really cool. I guess I should uh, talk to you guys a little bit about kind of your Viking history a little bit, because Magnus, this is not your first Viking rodeo. That sounds weird when I say it like that. But, you you know, you've worked a lot with kind of uh, Viking, uh, you know, shows uh, before. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, yeah, yeah. I've been working on the the Last Kingdom uh, on Netflix for a couple of years now. um, And I sort of died in that series then <laughs> returned in Valhalla, which is uh, the, was the <laughs> perfect move, uh, I think. Um, yeah, so I, I, I knew a lot, of, a lot about the, that time period, uh, obviously being a Dane, uh, just as Cecilia. Um, we, 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 we've grown up with, uh, with all these sagas, with all, this, all the story um, and, all, all, and yeah, the history. Um, but... But uh, but playing that character in the Last Kingdom gave me, uh, I would say, a, a good backbone for jumping onto to the Assassin's Creed Valhalla ship, um, and it's been such a fun ride. Aina, um, you know, you've uh, been uh, working within this kind of milieu like uh, before. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you've kind of worked on before this. Indeed, I have. Uh, well, actually. Um, as a musician uh, for the last, I would say, 20 or so years, I've, uh, I've sort of uh, dedicated myself fully um, to exploring and, and creating music with, um, with historical uh, Nordic and Norse instrumentation, um, mainly through, through a project called uh, Ward Runa. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's sort of my, my main outlet outlet for music and uh, started releasing albums with this in in 2009 and and shortly after that um, I got involved in the TV series Vikings uh, which it started out with them uh, using quite a lot of these uh, creations from um, from Wodruna and and then um, they kind of wanted that the sound of, of this uh, historical instrument and, and the textures I, I use more into the heart of the series. So I, I joined them, um, I was asked to join them uh, uh, on, on doing the actual soundtrack for the show. Um, addi- in addition to that, I, I have also worked quite a, quite a bit on, um, well, the stuff that goes on in front of the camera. Um, like anything uh, from drunken songs to battle cries or or, uh, different rituals, funerals and and so on. Um, I I create uh, these songs and work with the actors and um, or extras or even even perform twice on the show myself uh, in front of the camera. 
So, uh, oh wow! Yeah, Amazing. when when um, yeah, so so when uh, Assassin's Creed um, approached me uh, for for this project, it it felt like a, a a natural thing in in many ways, and they they were also quite familiar with my work and had had used a lot of my music in um, as like the the temporary music um, so far at that point and. Um, Ah, okay. Yeah. So, um, in in terms of obviously working on a game, like when you know, to create uh, the the music for it, where did you kind of draw your uh, inspirations from? Where did it come from? I would say that, uh, um, well, my 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 sort of philosophy with Wadruna is not to necessarily try and copy the the past. Like, it, it's not necessarily a goal to to make. Uh, authentic music, like 100%. It's more like taking something old and creating something new. Uh, th that being said, it's uh, it's sort of been really important for me uh, from the get-go to to do like serious studies in terms of in terms of the the ethnomusicology, like the history of these instruments. Um, yeah, study the primary sources basically, uh, both in terms of that and in terms of uh, Old Norse uh, various themes and, and um, poetic traditions and, and so on. Um, and so th that in itself is, uh, is, um, is quite an inspiring uh, thing. The, the old history is very fragmented, so, so it's, it's kind of a giant jigsaw to, to puzzle it all, uh, all together. Uh, so you have to have a very broad overview of of sources um, and um, I don't know a lot of these instruments are so um, visual in in how how they sound and um, so that in itself gives gives a lot of uh, inspiration some of the the instruments are so limited in, in what you can and cannot do so to, to a certain degree whatever you play on them will be what you can call within a range of being authentic, like how it how it would sound back then. I mean, and, th uh, tell us a little yeah. bit more, perhaps, about um, some of these in instruments that you're kind of um, alluding to. Um, do you actually have Do you actually have some in your because you're in your studio right now? Do you have any kind of around? Could you Could you show us some of them? Because it's all very well us saying, "Oh, you know, these things sound like this." Yeah. I mean, it's much better if you could. Uh, could you think you could show us some? That'd be really great. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, this is an instrument. Well, our, the the idea we had, or or sort of one of the the main things that I do do uh, in this game is um, to give voice and sound to to the old Norse poetic tradition, and and uh, that's the stuff that was performed by by the skalds, the poets. But in an oral society, these weren't just a poet. They were the news forecaster. They were the ge genealogist. They were kind of the living memory of uh, of the people in a way. So, um, so the idea was that we wanted to give um, give voice to these and 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 a very appropriate instrument then is is lyre, which is um, um, an instrument that uh, was very common in uh, in the Viking. Age, um, bo both in in um, on the British Isles and Northern Europe, in uh, yeah the the whole of Northern Europe, um, yeah, but it's an instrument that stretches much further back in time than that also. Um, oh wow! So How it, does it, it sound? You, can you can you play? Well, it you can basically you can either um, pluck it like a harp. Oh, that's so Or you calming. can. Um, or you can strum it like a guitar, and you stop the strings. And by by choosing which strings to to stop, you can create different chords. Oh wow! That's so great. that's um, that's one of the instruments that I use uh, quite a lot um, on the game, um, and. Um, yeah, it's it's sort of a, an instrument that uh, goes very well with storytelling and and um, yeah, uh, po po poetry and and singing, of course. 
Um, another instrument that I use quite a lot is, is yeah. bone flutes, which of course yeah. go back in time to yeah at least Stone Age. Um, I suppose the question is that, yes, I was about to say, do you have any horns? Because it just seems like that should definitely be a thing that you should have. Yeah. What yeah. does it sound like? Uh, al although like they, they, they weren't worn on the head. Uh, I mean, this is but, constant uh, bone of contention throughout this whole day. Everyone's <laughs> like, they're not on the head, never on the helmet. Yeah. Well, actually, they could be on the head, but they wouldn't go to war with them. So um, horns could no, be on the helmet, away. but more for ceremonial uh, yeah, yeah. And, and not in the Viking Age, much earlier. Um, so this is, a, this is a goat horn and the tradition of, of using uh, horns like this, um, both from, from cow and goat, that, that stretches off very far, far back in time. And it, it is actually a living tradition uh, of using uh, this instrument. Um, it's, uh, it's basically the, the mobile phone of the Viking Age um, <laughs> because it was used to communicate over, over vast distances. Um, so it's like an, an old it, Nokia phone, basically. Yeah, this is like the iHorn 5. <laughs> the I it has five playing, <laughs> home, playing holes. Um, and um, yeah, they, they would uh, like... Where it... Um, where the use of these survived was by uh, out in the pastures um, by mm. shepherds and, and such, um, both as means of communication, but also to, to call the animals back, like to be milked or, or whatever. Um, they also used horns like this to scare off predators. Um, but as a means to, to communicate over vast distances, that's basically the main use. Um, yeah. All right, send, send can, a text can, message for us. I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> yeah. So what did you say? Meet you at the pub? Uh, I said... Um, <laughs> Uh, no, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't. <laughs> I, I, I kind of cursed everything because it didn't behave. But that's the thing with that's yeah. the thing with uh, nature instruments. They they don't they have a will of their own and and don't always mm. behave, which is can be quite uh, um, challenging in a setting like in in big uh, musical productions like both mm -hmm. of course when playing live but also in 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 studio sessions where you have a short deadline uh, and such because they don't always behave and they're very very um easily affected by by temperature and and um yeah, moist and all of those things. So they don't. Yeah, yeah. it it can be a challenge when when the deadline is tight and and you have to get <laughs> these. Like, Come on, horn, just work. Yeah, um, I think um, I think actually we even have um, we actually have a video clip of you performing that we can actually go and take a look at now. That was a, a lovely little segue you gave us there. Thanks.
I mean, my goodness, I don't think we're going to be devoid of emotions and feeling uh, within this game at all after that. May I just add that the job you've done, Einar, is just amazing. Uh, it's, it's, it's so good. Uh, yeah, it really gives this game something extraordinary and it's, it's so special. I just want to congratulate you for your brilliant work. Thank you. Oh, Einar, you made Magnus feel things. You've warmed yeah. your fucking yeah. blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, I'm proud of that. Cecilia, though, this was your very first ever kind of venture into doing something Viking-y, is that right? Yes, I'm a Viking novice. So this was my first uh, <laughs> adventure into this uh, into this world, and it's been such a cool, cool journey. Um, but of course, it's 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 in my DNA because I'm I'm a Scandinavian. I'm a Danish person, so I was brought up with all these bedtime stories, stories about the sagas, stories about the Vikings. And actually, I grew up very close to a Viking museum, so I was standing as a kiddo holding on to some of the old Viking ships and probably dreamt about being a Viking. So so it's a dream come <laughs> true doing this AZ game. It's so, so cool. And I think Eivor is, is, is a, she's the perfect Viking. She's got the balance between her, but the raging and also the, the humanity and, and the craving for finding a home so i hope yeah i hope uh, people see her the same way that that, that me and myonas does she's 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 a cool cool lone wolf yeah. <laughs> um so i suppose it you know it's kind of a big uh so you know Cecilia, it's your first time kind of doing something vikingy but also it's, magnus this was kind of your first time also like doing mocap and stuff like that what was that like well, um, I must say it was very different. Um, I uh, I shot my last scene in The Last Kingdom two weeks before mm. flying to Montreal and uh, doing my first motion capture uh, scenes as uh, Eivor. And the first thing I had to do was to cut off my beard. Um, because uh, Vikings in <laughs> Assassin's Creed, is they are um, clean-shaved. Um <laughs> Well, that was because of the motion capture, because they had to have yeah, dots yeah. in my face and had to do all the facial, uh, had facial scans and all um, micro uh, expressions. So that, that was weird, like losing my Viking <laughs> to play this Viking. <laughs> a Viking. That was a, that was a <laughs> very weird first jump. Um, and also, I was used to having full full body armor and 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 face tattoos scars weapons and and a hundred stunt guys on horses behind me shouting yeah and now i had nothing i <laughs> this big room. big empty room um yeah yeah, yeah with a with hundred cameras in the ceiling and four steady cam guys running around filming and i was in a very tight black uh a uh, spandex suit with dots on it and a uh, war helmet with four cameras on and there was like being filming some sort of 90s aerobics uh, studio <laughs> setting um but then then quite fast uh, it, it 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 dawned on me how 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 this this the things uh, how it worked because um Everything is possible when you're doing motion capture. I mean, everything is is is, is suddenly possible um, because those boxes over there they can be the castle, and when you see it on the screen, it suddenly it it is the castle, and 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 two guys behind me can be a hundred uh, soldiers. It's, it's so easy to fix fix uh, this yeah. because of the 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 cameras and the 3D and all that, and. So it was, it was something about a in Assassin's Creed. You can say it was a leap of faith uh, into yeah. to <laughs> shooting shooting uh, all this stuff uh, in motion capture. Um, but for me, I, I just needed a little bit of help to become this this uh, this Viking yeah. hero. I I I, <laughs> I I I couldn't feel it in the beginning. So so I asked for uh, I asked for an axe, an axe, so I could ha carry an axe in, the, in my belt. <laughs> And that that actually gave me something extra because I, suddenly I had a weapon that, that that gave me something about how I I, I could move around 
also one of the first scenes I I shot in motion capture. They gave me a bow because uh, Eivor is is jumping around, uh, following uh, something I can't spoil. Um, <laughs> and that that <laughs> oh yeah, and that that just just having that bow in my minefield hand gave me yeah. uh, a physical uh, movement, and 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 I, I got that feeling of oh there there he is. There's, there's oh, you've got it now. You just needed um, a weapon. You just needed to feel that, Magnus. I, I needed just a little bit because when you're shooting film, you get it all. You, you, they yeah. make you look like a billion, and then they give you the army and they put you on that big horse, yeah. and then they but say, "You're on your drama oh, school days, you know, imagining you're yeah. like an animal yes. or something yeah. for a year." Yeah. Motion yeah. captures like. And um, Cecilia, how did you find it? It's it's a it's like a, it's like a combo between uh, doing theater and doing film in the same kind of weird sense. I, I thought it was super fun actually. I, I would have, I but it is like Mag Magnus says. It's, it's you have to imagine the entire universe, and then you have all these cameras, and also you have these cameras very very close to your face and light very close to your face, so you can actually see that much too. And then um, I thought it was so odd, you know, they say, oh, and now Eva goes over there and picks up her bow. And I was like, OK, I'm going to go over there. I'm going to walk over there. It's going to be OK. I was like, and the bow is what? And it's uh, and it's made of plastic. So so you have to imagine and create the weight of the bow, too, when you grab it. And and it, at first it, feel, it feels kind of odd, actually. But but I actually love to to work like that because then I can imagine and and created myself the whole imaginary world and if and if we as actors needed some help we can just ask some of the very cool directors in the room who will say okay over there there's a spoiler alert and over here there's another sp <laughs> i cannot tell you but but um <laughs> but uh but it was super super fun to work like that and um and 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 actually the it, it the it gives you a lot of freedom and it's it's amazing to be able to dig into the character. You can actually create her physically, and not only as a voice, but also do 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 the embodiment too. I thought it was, mm. you know, it's a great first Viking experience. And Ryan, coming to you. Yeah, well, gosh, the um, the experiences were were somewhat different for for me for. Um, uh, AC Valhalla in in comparison to Last Kingdom. So for for Last Kingdom, I they they flew me out to see the set in uh, near Budapest and, and kind of seeing this. I had this experience of going from uh, modern day Winchester early in the morning to uh, seeing this this kind of ninth century Winchester uh, sort of later in the afternoon. It was kind of a weird disconnect from Winchester to Winchester, really. And and so you know, I was I was shown the the vision of the uh, the uh, production team for the for the set and for the AC Valhalla team. It was seeing them coming into my little corner of of england in in this sort of magical mystery tour bus that they were you know all the programmers and developers and and what that's so, you know it was a, it was a blur you know sort of meeting all these people what do you do what do you do trying to understand what they you know how how this kind of how your your kind of production works and uh i was i was basically i had the honor of being a, a tour guide for a few places a few historical places in in wessex in alfred the great's kingdom and uh, sort of showing showing around different historical places and, and getting this sort of sense of yeah if you look over here you can sort of see the landscape spread out below the the hill and uh it was you know it was an opportunity to be uh you know go go to go to being a history lecturer really and trying to inspire the team at the beginning of their their production process I mean, I think it's fair to say that every single person on this panel has got like a really good kind of wealth of knowledge now of, you know, what it's like uh, to, to kind of, you know, know about kind of like Viking history and traditions. And I kind of wanted to sort of like pull it away from uh, just the sort of the, you know, the kind of mocap side of it and the actual making of the game and kind of talk a little bit more about um, the kind of like Nordic and kind of pagan kind of traditions. Um, so, Julien, what was kind of some of the things uh, that you kind of noticed through uh, making the game? some of the things that sort of stood out because obviously you're filling in a lot of the gaps but you're also having to use some of that source material uh, as well 
Yeah, I mean, we uh, doing our research and talking to people and kind of really diving into the world of Vikings. We we found out actually that the Norse culture was was very very complex. Um, it was super interesting because it felt many times that reactions of the people were kind of very different from something that we're used to with their their notion of honor, for example, uh, the way that it is a very fatalistic culture, um, the culture that was kind of bred through very harsh, you know, land and so on. So you can really feel that. And it was it was really cool to portray that in a game because it gives us so many opportunities to tell stories, um, but also very personal and human stories, a bit like Cecilia was talking about. We, we're, we have this, this opportunity to tell uh, stories about really human characters. And because Vikings are not documented that much into history, we were able to kind of tell, you know, what were the motivations behind the raiding, behind the, what was the driving these people to kind of go in other lands and so on. So for us as, as game developers, it was just a very fertile ground for really cool stories that had kind of different foundations than what were were used to basically because of the culture, because of the belief system, because of basically who the Norse were. And for us, it was just a, a super nice ride. I mean, would you say, I mean, maybe I'll throw this one over to uh, Magnus and say, you know, did you feel like, obviously, because when something's kind of quite popular, you know, uh, it's potentially not treated, uh, the source material and the stories aren't necessarily always treated kind of in the right way. But do you feel now that like, that's kind of like shifted that actually, you know, people are kind of looking more uh, Viking history and kind of dealing with it in a res more respectful manner. Well, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. I've, I've seen um, scripts and ideas that were, um, well, sort of silly and, and didn't, and yeah, didn't treat, uh, treat the think the subject with, with the, the respect that a, uh, that I think it, it it needs and deserves, um, but but I also think before just taking taking Assassin's Creed as an example, I think it's really cool that what you what you get here is is you get a reason for why they are traveling to uh, England. It's it's not only it's not about raiding and killing and all that which uh, has been told for years and years and years that that is the vikings that is pillage and burn it's they they needed they needed a, a place to live because they they couldn't they couldn't grow crops in in norway or in sweden or in denmark at that t time they they needed a place to 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 well to live for generation after generation and and um they needed to to find their valhalla in our time so to speak um they they needed to to to, to, to well to live. Um, it's not it was not all, all about uh, the the blood and war and and conquering gold and all that. Yeah, well, I suppose that's the thing as well. And I, I suppose uh, Cecilia, for you, you know, you're a new uh, mama. It's you know, it doesn't really matter kind of uh, where you come from. Fundamentally, you want like a nice place to live. You want your family to be safe. You want you know food on the table, regardless of what almost like what period of uh, history it is. And uh, I mean, Cecilia, did you sort of feel that that like um, that you know the, the character that you played ended up being fully rounded in in that regard? I think so. Yeah, definitely. And and the. Uh... Everybody needs a home, you know, and so does Eivor. And 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 I think, I think yes, absolutely, absolutely. But uh, the Vikings were also, you know, they were also trading. They were they were, they were, not only killers, you know, as as Magnus says. And I think that that Eivor in 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 Valhalla is is not only just killing people. You of course you can perhaps go through the game and just whack people down. But 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 um but but I think the 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 interesting thing is also the the characters encounter with other characters and 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 you can of course create that yourself when you when you as a player go go through the game. And then you'll find that that she's a whole person or he is a whole person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's I think for the for our chat with the creators, what they went for was was to to make a a person that people would follow, people would uh, make alliances with, and and that people would fall in love with, not just a, uh, an angry 
crazy berserker brute um, because you get that side of uh, Eivor as well but you need to have the, the sensible uh, adventurous um, guy and, and, and girl that, that, that just want to want to experience uh, all of this as well, and also to, to take care of, of, of uh, his and hers clan. Well, Valhalla is a fictive story. It's written by brilliant minds, and, and, the, and the writings that they, these guys have done is, is amazing. And I think that in that sense, um, Eivor, is, 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 uh, she, she's, she, she becomes a legendary character, because uh, she he is... Uh, is is so is so rich and round, and 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 that's so interesting. And I, and I think that must be so interesting for the fans to 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 play and 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 encounter with. Well, I can't wait myself personally to kind of. All you're doing is you guys are like totally wetting my appetite for actually playing the game, and you're not telling me anything because you're not revealing any spoilers, which is sort of annoying. But I'm kind of no, glad you're also not play the game. But, you know. No, no, I, I will, I will. But um, but um, I suppose. You know, if we're going to kind of circle it full back to the sort of, you know, Viking trend in entertainment and it's so hot right now. Vikings are just, you know, are we at peak Viking? Is there more Vikinging to be done or are we are we now? Is this the pinnacle Assassin's Creed Valhalla? It's the pinnacle of uh, Vikinging. <laughs> this what is obviously think? going to be the best. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's got to be a but, hard one but to I, top, I think. But I, but I think it will, it, it will go on for a couple of years more. Uh, there's still things coming up, um, and I think this will only uh, make it bigger. It is very, very rich, and even, even though we made a pretty big game out of it, we felt that we were only touching the surface. So there are many other sagas and stories to be told in that, uh, in that wonderful era with those uh, wonderful people. So I hope it inspires many more things to come. Oh, amazing. Well, that's all the time we've got for this panel, unfortunately. Sorry, each one of these panels is just, we could keep going, but unfortunately we have to kind of uh, cut it off now because we are going to go away for a break. Uh, so thank you to uh, the you all of you guys for all of your insights uh, uh, on the panel, and we'll see you just in a few minutes. Don't go anywhere. Assassin's Creed Valhalla and Xbox present Echoes of Valhalla, Life of Vikings, the podcast. Beware of the silence. The land still echoes with the battle cries. Listen! This is the story of my ancestors. The story of my people. The children of the Great North. You may have heard it from the mouths of our enemies or read the words written by Christian monks. But before I disappear, I, the heiress, wish to tell the tale of what really happened. This is our truth. The truth of the Vikings. In the beginning, being a Viking, Lucy Malbos, lecturer in medieval history at the University of Poitiers, didn't mean belonging to an ethnicity or to a particular population. It was a way to make a living. It wasn't about who you are, but rather what you did. In ancient Scandinavian, in Norse, Viking refers to the activity of going on expedition by sea to find loot. Alban Gauthier, professor of medieval history at the University of Caen. A Viking is someone who goes Viking, meaning someone who sets sail, hoping to become rich. This is where it all began. Imagine a majestic landscape, snow-capped mountains, rocky overhangs, green valleys, winding silver rivers. This land was the birthplace of my ancestors. Before becoming traders and warriors, they were farmers, fishermen, free men, 
and tireless workers. They bred pigs, cattle and chicken. They grew oats, barley, wheat, peas, turnips and cabbages. But the land was rough and not always giving. When this occurred, the men would dream of a land elsewhere that was milder beyond the sea. Oh, look at this soil. Nothing else will grow here. The harsh winter has not been kind to us. Maybe when the sun returns and... No, listen to me, my son. If I had the choice, I'd have stayed here and worked the land until my last breath. But it's the will of the gods. I have to accept Sven's proposition and sail to greener lands. So little is known about our people. Yet there are so many misconceptions that they were barbarians, looters, mercenaries even. While it is true that my people can be cruel on the battlefield, easily offended at the slightest insult to the clan, and quarrelsome even at home, they also enjoy sitting by the hearth in the peace of the Scali, the main area where the whole family gathers together. See how your son looks at you. He's already proud of you. One day I'll be proud of him. He'll be a great warrior, just like his father, you can tell. Let him learn to walk before putting an axe in his hands. He's so young. Put another log on the fire to keep us warm. And disagreeing with her was out of the question. While men give orders on the battlefield, make no mistake, we women are the uncontested leaders of the household. We reign supreme at home. La femme libre the free married woman is the guardian of the household when her husband's away on an expedition. And what symbolizes her responsibilities and duties at home is the keychain she usually has on her belt. Despite all this, she's not equal to men. She can't partake in politics and legal affairs. Arts and crafts play an essential part in our culture. We sculpt wood, amber, ivory and blow glass. We have gold at the tips of our fingers. We make unbelievably refined jewellery that turns women into goddesses. And of course, we have mastered the art of weapon making. As worthy disciples of Voland, the god of forges, our blacksmiths are genuine masters in their domain. Blacksmith! Blacksmith! I am here, on the other side. Ah, I can't hear the sound of your hammer. Does that mean my axe is ready? Yes, I have just finished working on it. It took me all night. Here it is, look. By Thor, what a blade. It's beautifully finished. You outdid yourself, blacksmith. Take it and tell me how it feels. <laughs> it's perfectly balanced and it's a joy to hold. Can I try it out on this log? <laughs> that is what it's there for. What power. I can't wait to test it in battle. You will soon have the chance. I hear the day of battle is drawing closer. Good, I'd rather split a skull than a log. <laughs> His joy was far from misplaced. The blacksmith was right. A great battle was brewing. The day before, during the Thing, the solemn assembly, my people had decided to ally with Chief Ivar Ragnarsson, known as Ivar the Boneless. In those days, wars between rival kingdoms were common. Each wished to extend their power over the vast lands to the south. But Ivar was by far the most fearsome of them all. He was said to be a berserker, a wild warrior endowed with sacred strength, just like in the sagas. He is believed to have had uncontrollable rage and caused immeasurable destruction. But above all else, he was cunning. He already ruled over a large swathe of land, but wanted to assert his power at all costs, even the cost of blood. I, Ivar Ragnarsson, swear to lead you to victory. Pledge your allegiance. Bow down to my rule. You shall not be disappointed. You will swim in glory and wealth if you follow me. But be warned, whoever dares to betray me will be judged by my axe. Ivar was a man of his word. The alliance was sealed. Ivar Ragnarsson, Ivar Ragnarsson, just like his name alludes to, is the son of Ragnar, a legendary person whose journey is difficult to trace. 
this term berserker gang that a warrior might get into such a rage. Ryan Lavelle, Professor of History of the Dark Ages at the University of Winchester. That they bite the edge of the shields and froth out of their mouth, tear off their clothes or, or might be wearing the fur of a bear. This is something of a, a legend of late Viking Age, even of the later Middle Ages themselves, when Icelandic storytellers were sat around the fireside. Dawn had just broken, and men had already gathered in the early morning light. The mist was beginning to lift over the plains. The green lands glimmered in the morning dew. Who could have thought that mere moments from then, this peaceful haven would welcome such carnage? Sons of the Great North, my brethren, wield your weapons, make the earth quake, and fill the skies with your cries of fury! If we are victorious, tonight we shall feast at the banquet with our wives. And if we fall, we shall sit in the great company of the Valkyrie, in the splendor of Valhalla. We fear not death. Let Odin lead us to victory. It appears that Odin had heard Ivar's declamation and that the Valkyrie had lent wings to the warriors. They descended upon their enemies like a metal whirlwind. all raged on until midday. Yes, the gods gave us victory, but a terrible victory it was. The plains were drenched in blood and scattered with lifeless bodies. My arm. I got hit by a spear. I killed my opponent. Look. I am here, my brother. You are suffering, but without you we may never have won this battle. Show me your wounds. Uh, what makes you smile? <laughs> you remind me of the god Tyr, who sacrificed his arm to conquer the wolf Fenrir. I am lucky to have you by my side. You think I'll lose my arm? No, no, we will tend to it, and soon you will be wielding your axe, ready to strike down new enemies. Oh, that's a relief. I'd like to be as brave as Tyr, but keep my arms and legs, if it's all possible. <laughs> At least the pain hasn't dulled your sense of humor. Rest now, and do not forget to pray for those we have lost. The Scandinavians fight amongst themselves and steal from each other. François Emion, Professor of Nordic Studies at the Sorbonne University. Before Norway, Sweden and Denmark were unified, there were little principalities, small kingdoms, who waged war on each other or partnered up, depending on the situation. It's a rather unstable society. These clans are separated by mountains, which can be very tall and covered with a lot of snow. Or, for example, in Norway, they're separated by dense forests, which means communication isn't easy. This explains why Scandinavian societies are organized in a divided, separated and distinct fashion. For the honor of our banner, my people were ready to sacrifice both their arms. But once again, the gods had spared them. Alas, this was not the fate of some companions who had fallen on the plain. That night, their funeral was celebrated. We called upon Volva, our priestess and prophetess. Following the ancient traditions, the deceased's eyes and mouths were shut. Their bodies were washed, their hair combed, and nails were cut. They were given their weapons to help on the arduous journey that would lead them to Valhalla. The priestess said a few final words before one of us set the funeral pyre ablaze. We honor our men who fell in combat. May the fire cleanse their corpses. May the earth welcome their ashes. May the soaring raven lead them to the kingdom of the dead. There are a certain number of sites in the south of Norway where there are gigantic grave mounds that haven't been pillaged from, unlike those in the Egyptian pyramids that have been stolen from all through this. In these pyramids, we found boats in which an aristocrat was laid to rest. Some of these boats contained cremations, and sometimes there were other bodies too. But we don't know if they were slaves who were killed when their master died, or if they were people who were buried afterwards. 
The men and women of the village gathered to give thanks to the gods through offerings and sacrifices. Young women formed a circle around the priestess. They chanted sacred formulas to look into the future by contacting the norms that control our destiny. Our people still adhere to the age-old precepts of Four Sither, our religious tradition. To you, Odin, king of the gods, we sacrifice this horse. <laughs> to you, Tyr, god of war, we sacrifice this bull. May their flesh give you thanks for our victory, and may their blood be evidence of our veneration. La vulva, une sorte the priestess de is some kind of witch prophetess, a rather marginal person in Scandinavian society. We generally call upon her services during crises to find out the secret of the gods. This figure is feared and dreaded. Even Odin calls upon this priestess to learn his destiny. After the ceremonies, a great banquet was held to celebrate victory. The table was covered in victuals, the wine was flowing, the men feasted by the blazing fire, the moon was full. The sky glittered with myriad stars, as if Valhalla itself were lighting up the banquet, as if our fallen brothers were trying to feast in our company. The leader who wants to show off his power, greatness and wealth must do it in a visible and conspicuous way. One of the best ways to show off his power and wealth is to organize a big feast. The Vikings are players. Thierry Noël, a content and inspiration consultant at Ubisoft. They played famous verbal jousting games called flighting, and that is exactly what we see in the game. In the middle of the celebration, Ivar demanded silence. He had great news to give. Listen, this victory is a sign that Odin is with us, but it is just the beginning. My friends, my brethren, will you follow me into battle across the seas? I vow that I will lead the way and we will wage war in every part of the world. A rousing speech. Cries of joy carried all the way to the coast. The men were anxious to take part in this conquest, which promised to be extraordinary. In the event of victory, it guaranteed titles, honors, and fortune. And if they were to fall in battle, then they knew they would witness the glorious, the majestic gates of Valhalla. Now, on this particular panel, we're going to be deep diving a little bit further into Nordic uh, mythology and kind of Norse society and kind of the belief structures uh, around there and, and, and how, of course, you know, you know, looking at a period of time where there is such little information, how we can actually find out these things. So uh, joining us on this panel, we have uh, Thierry Noel, who's the inspirational content advisor for Ubisoft Paris. We have uh, Philippe uh, Bergeron, who also is Fizz, uh, the level design director from Ubisoft Montreal. We have Lucy Malvos, professor at the University of Poitiers, and Ryan Lavelle, who is professor at the University of Winchester also. And not forgetting, of course, our narrative director from Ubisoft Montreal, Darby McDevitt. How are we all doing? Oh, good. good. Yeah, I hope. Good. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so, um, first of all, uh, as I was saying, sort of in the intro, you know, this is a period of time where there isn't a lot of information. So, how would you find out just exactly kind of what these kind of beliefs were, and what kind of uh, you know information can you kind of use to kind of glean that data from when there's kind of slim pickings, as it were? Um, I might direct that first one to you, Lucy. As concerned beliefs and religion. And mythology, most of the informations come from the Eddas, uh, written in the 13th century, where you can find these uh, very famous figures like Odin, Thor, Freya, and the others. Uh, all the gods uh, we, we can think about, very human ones, they are mortals. The gods in the Scandinavian world are mortals, and then they can hate, they can love, they are very close from the human world. 
And um, Ryan, what what kind of other places other than that can you can we sort of like collect some of this uh, data from 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 your standpoint? Gosh, I, well, I I tend to look at the well, I, I like to sort of look at the landscape if I can and and think about the the sort of significance of uh, sites of meaning uh, to the people of the time and the the locations of those those places. And in Scandinavia, there are, you, you've you've kind of got. Um, like uh, water features, the, so sources of water, places within rivers that uh, that might have some some religious meaning or sacred groves and, uh, of, of trees, and uh, they so that those are are kind of elements, and they're they're still they still have elements in the uh, the Scandinavian landscape which which have uh, meaning, which have stories associated with them uh, as well. Uh, so that's that's part of the the kind of ways of, of thinking about how people at the time thought about their uh, their environment. And um, Darby, so, you know, how do you then kind of go about sort of looking at these particular bits of information and then kind of how do you uh, draw them in to make something that would seem as realistic as it possibly can be? For different parts of the game, we took a look at different, um, especially like uh, sections of the Poetic Edda, for our, what we're calling our myth worlds, we we actually dove into a lot of the stories about Odin himself, and we we tried to kind of take uh, I'd say a greatest hits of Odin's adventures and put them together in our myth worlds, so that you can that uh, our character Eivor can kind of experience um, chapters in Odin's life as in his sort of endless acquisition for wisdom and his endless attempts to avoid dying and within the jaws of a giant wolf. Uh, named Fenrir, we we took a lot of inspiration from those stories and we kind of shaped them into something fun. Um, we also used uh, a specific section called the Havamal, which is the sayings of the High One. It's a, ostensibly written by Odin himself, and it contains a lot of really just cool information about how to live a good life. and uh, And we tried to we tried to stuff that into the corners of uh, of our world. A lot of Vikings, um, our Norse characters in our in our game, will will speak these words uh, as if they're some sort of wisdom passed down from a long time past. So we kind of we we pick and choose to to use these old sources, but make them feel like they're living and make them feel like they are present on the lips of these characters as if this is a religion that informs their everyday life. What well, some of um, Odin's like top tips then for a better life? I mean, just so I could get some of that info now. Is there anything good? Uh, yeah. What's uh, Anyone can jump in on this because we all have our favorites. There's honor. There's honor. <laughs> is a there's sort of deep, deep honor, isn't yeah. there? Reputation. Yeah, it's all about honor. Yeah. And even simple stuff. There's one that's just like when you're going to go through a new doorway that is unfamiliar to you, be careful and take care to look around before you step through because you don't know what is waiting for you on the other side. Some really just small practical things or ones like just get a good night rest and don't, don't take your worries to bed with you because if you wake up, you'll still have those worries and you won't have slept very well. Um, stuff like that. It's, it's really, uh, the Havamal is great. It's, it's the, I feel like it's the closest thing we have to a religious text, although it was written quite a bit of time later, so it's not like Vikings were carrying this around with them, consulting it. Um, but, you know, maybe these were passed down, you know, verbally. Uh, the, they could tell you better than I could. It feels like it's the sort of a uh, book that you would see, like one of those little small books when you go to like a cash register in like a petrol station. You know, it's like top ways to. Yeah. Someone really obviously needs to to create this as a thing. Yeah. Well, um, fit, uh, well, the, the sorry, the the uh, the historian Jackson Crawford, who we used for a lot of the runes in our game, he actually just published a Havamal, and it's called the Traveler's Havamal. It's about this big. It's great. It's uh, it's sat by my desk for a, quite a long time while I was writing, and I would always just. Um, just pick it up. So it is, there is a there is a little traveler's version if you if you want it. <laughs> okay, brilliant, perfect, sold straight away. Um, Fizz, what did you learn uh, from uh, you know obviously working on working on the game? Was there any kind of great wisdom that you found imparted upon yourself from from these beliefs? I think I think like um, like reading the Havamal was probably one of the better ones because as Darby said, it's, it, it really is like a gentleman's guide to life. Um, like just how to be a decent human being. Um, don't be a douchebag. Um, always be kind to your neighbors. I think that statement uh, covers a lot of stuff. Just don't be a yeah. douchebag. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's the catch all. Um, so like for me, there is, 
Like there's a lot of like Odin's wisdom and which are things that I think a lot of us apply on a day to day life. And it was sort of, it was fun to see it from like, you know, this is technically from the perspective of a God, but it is Odin, the wanderer, like his experiences going through life and seeing these things. So for me, that was, it was, just, it, it humanizes the character that is the, the all father that is Odin as a common man that everybody can imagine in their day to day lives. Thierry, did you have any kind of, you know, Viking life epiphanies through playing the game? Anything that it, wisdom that it's imparted upon you that you can share with everyone? <laughs> no, but uh, what uh, what Fitz says is, is important because in uh, all the texts we have are really personal. They really touch something that is really uh, uh, an individual behavior. I mean, one can e identify easily with that. It's not like talking about big history. It's always advices that we... We couldn't understand now as individuals. Uh, that's uh, what makes it really interesting, I think. Well, I suppose that's yeah, the thing, yeah. isn't it? You know, you think about all this time back in, in the past in history and how things must have been very, very different. But then I think fundamentally everyone worries about the same kind of things. People kind of want to be a good person. I guess that's kind of, I mean, historians, Ryan, tell me. I mean, surely that's the same throughout history. Everyone kind of yeah. wants to do well and look after their family, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that uh, that this this game's doing is allowing us to sort of think in a sort of granular way about the uh, the individual's motivations. And okay, sometimes those motivations can be very different from uh, those in the the twenty first century. Sometimes, and and that you know that that sort of aspect of the the driving force of honour uh, is could be. Uh, you know, it could be a significant difference for for some, and the, uh, but there is that that sort of element that, effectively, when we look back on historical periods, we're we're seeing people with very human behaviours, very human motivations. Though you know, those those motivations might be slightly different, but fundamentally, they're like us. So whilst, you know, we've got this idea of what everyone uh, believes in, I, I suppose one thing that every generation likes to think, uh, well, they like to think that they know, have all the answers, you know, and, and no greater time than now we think that we have all the answers to everything with the endless amounts of data that we have. And then, you know, 2020 comes along and no one suspected anything. Um, so in terms of, you know, predicting the future or looking looking forward, what, you know, what did that era, how did they... How did they look forward or kind of at least begin to kind of guess what the future would hold? I'll throw that over to um, Lucy. Talk to, talk to me about how they predicted the future. To predict the future, they have a, a specialist of the future, uh, a kind of a seer uh, who can see the future and tell the future to human beings, especially in time of crisis, but also to the God. Even the gods uh, ignore and want to know the future and Odin in some, himself asked a seer to tell him the, the end of the world and the seer uh, is answering by telling him the Ragnarok is going to happen. Dramatic pause. Okay. Um, so, um, R Ryan, how would they, how would they, what would, how would they actually do this though? Like how, cause I mean, you know, we have many different ways, you know, people read tarot cards and, you know, different kind of things yeah, like that. Yeah. How, how would a seer kind of read the future as it were? Oh gosh. Uh, well, there's, I mean, there are there are people who are far more specialist on this this aspect of things than I. But there's there's things like drawing runes, pulling pulling out runes, uh, sticks with runic letters that sim have different symbolic meanings on them. That that could be part of the. Uh, mm. I, I mean, the, that's certainly the um, that's certainly what Lucy was uh, referring to with with Odin and uh, the you know the use of the runes as as a as a kind of vision, as a sense of the vision of the, mm. the future. And and I think what they're doing is they're drawing on this this idea of cyclical time, of the idea that uh, that time is something which is uh, sort of written in the past, but also written in the future and has this uh, this sort of predetermined end uh, as well as a predetermined beginning. So all these things are, are coming together in, uh, in in what they're trying to do. Oh, wow, that's interesting. I mean, uh, Darby, in terms of, you know, uh, we actually have a, you have a character within the game who sort of provides this kind of look to the future. Uh, we have a character named Valka, who is, who is this, this here. And um, th it's through her that um, Eivor begins to um, 
encounter these sort of prophetic visions. We took a lot of inspiration from, uh, I think it was mentioned the the it's called the Voluspa, and it's the this this the seer's prophecy of how the world is going to end that uh, we actually open our game with a version of that um, the, from the first second. Um, but we carry this idea all the way through where Eivor will return to the seer time and time again to access these, uh, these um, what we call myth worlds, but these kind of this higher plane of, uh, of understanding, trying to get to the bottom of what is exactly driving Eivor's fate. Like, what what is the con? What are the contours of Eivor's fate? How is it all going to play out in the end? Um, this is something that even in the historical sagas we see uh, uh, this kind of little sprinkling of what they felt to be magic. And there's Egil's saga has uh, has a moment where Egil's handed a, a brew and he thinks it's poison in it, so he just draws some runes on it, and boom, the poison disappears. And this is supposed to be a historical saga, but there's there's sprinklings of that magic even in those. So we wanted to bring that into this game too, where um, it's not magic exactly, but it's 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 what people believed would would be magic and how their lives would unfold uh, if they uh, if they earnestly believed in these kind of forces. Now I should be a little bit careful about this next question, uh, but uh, Fizz, so apparently you know you've got some mythical settings uh, within the game. What can you actually tell us? Right. Uh, so Vikings had a like part of their belief system was the existence of multiple realms uh, with uh, of the world. Um, Earth, where we live as human beings, uh, was what they would call Midgard. Um, and there's nine uh, there's a total of nine realms, uh, Midgard being one of them. Um, in the game, we the player will get to uh, visit um, Asgard. Uh, being the realm of the gods, and Jotunheim, which is the realm of uh, the giants, which I'm sure Lucy can tell us more about. Yeah, Lucy, can you tell us a bit more, a bit more about those uh, particular locations? Uh, yeah, well, every kind of being has his world, uh, nine worlds in, uh, in all, and uh, the pivotal point uh, for this nine world is a big tree, the world tree, called Yggdrasil, and uh, all these nine worlds is, are organized around this uh, this tree, this world tree. I mean, I, I know we can't go into it anymore, so I'm going to, you know, maybe swiftly move over to uh, just leave it be, Julia. The problem is, it's like I want to get all these spoilers out, but it's yeah, it's not it's not the time <laughs> for that now, Julia. Um, so within the game, obviously, Eivor, you know, you can play as a male or female character, sort of uh, whatever sort of kind of takes your preference. So I suppose what would be quite nice to know, actually, is to find out a little bit more about uh, women themselves within um, uh, Norse society. So, um, Lucy, what can you tell us about what, what women's role was uh, within those days? Yeah, women uh, plays an important role in Scandinavia. Uh, in the household, she's the keeper of the keys, she's the keeper of the household, and um, that's, that uh, gives her some power. And um, have, there, have there been sort of other examples within, because uh, obviously Eivor, you know, is, is, a, is a warrior. Have there been sort of some, um, you know, uh, historical sort of evidence that this uh, might be uh, apparent within the culture? Yeah, there are no, not so much evidences of, uh, of women warrior among Vikings, but you have some mentions in the sagas and uh, also a famous grave in Sweden, uh, which uh, is in the place called Birka. And uh, it's uh, uh, a grave with all weapons, all stuff we can wait from a, a great warrior grave, but uh, DNA analysis has proved that it was not the grave of a man, but it was a grave of a woman. So yes, I love uh, it. there the are lots thickens. of, <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of uh, hypotheses and uh, new ideas, but uh, the fact is uh, funeral data are very tricky to interpret. They always have a symbolic meaning. And uh, so it's very difficult to say, uh, yes, it was the grave of a warrior woman. And actually, uh, she, she is not wearing any injuries and uh, any traces of injuries. Uh, and don't. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> <laughs> she was a really good fighter and never got hit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Damn straight, that's um, totally but, possible. 
Yeah, yeah. But it, what it does is it, it sort of shows a flexibility to gender and the Viking age that these, you know, what what we have as modern, you know, what our modern expectations of of gender as a as a sort of constructed idea is is something which could be that little bit different or, or, or perhaps a lot different in, you know, a thousand years ago. And uh, that's, I think that's one of the things that the interpretations of the, uh, the Birka um, burial is, is allowing us as uh, historians and archaeologists to, to think about. So, you know, whether, whether this is somebody who's biologically a woman, but identi- is identifying along the, the, uh, the, the kind of social uh, setting of of uh, male behaviour, or, or simply this is who she was. You know, this is a demonstration of who she was. I, you know, that's that's kind of open to a lot of different interpretations, um, but it's it's allowing a lot of um, a lot of really interesting discussion to to come from it, and uh, and of course it it does feed directly into uh, into what. Uh, uh, what you're trying to do with AC Valhalla, it doesn't fit as well. So. Well, we take a lot of clues from the sagas as well, and and certainly the the Norse imagination was open to a lot of women who were uh, getting involved in in fighting. I, I think more so than a lot of um, myths from other cultures. Um, I was struck quite a bit by the the appearance of of women like uh, Brunhilde in in the uh, the Volsung or uh, Freydis in the Vinland saga or um, her, uh, the saga of Hervor and Hedric I think I'm saying that right where there's these women who actively take up swords and go into battle so and and even with the god Freya who had her own hall Folkvanger and she selected half of the dead for her her hall there's this at least this imagination um, that they're primed for this idea, and we just we wanted to bring that to life um, uh, in in a, as in an exciting way in our game, um, and I think we did that. The picture of women in the sagas are uh, is a, a later one. It's a picture uh, from the 13th century, so it's the representation of women from the 13th century. It's a rip- oh, yes, all the Christians course. who are afraid of the, of the yeah. ladies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <maybe. laughs> um, they're like, they, they're like, as an example, like, let's not go back here again because, no, I don't know. Those women <laughs> with their <laughs> ideas that, that, and axes and <laughs> and opinions. Oh no, yeah. not opinions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, goodness me. Um, I, I do recommend. I do recommend everyone read the Vinland Saga with Freydis. It's a really like crazy where it's like she leads this this uh, expedition to to uh, to Vinland, which is North America, and all kinds of things go crazy, and she ends up like deciding to kill the other guy that's there because he's getting a little too uh, he's getting a little too uh, unwieldy, and it's. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a it's an exciting drama. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I suppose um, in one sentence, uh, if you could, if you yourself could be uh, one of the, you know, either the characters from the game or some, you know, a person from this kind of uh, this particular period of time, who would you who would you go for? I'm going to chuck that first one to you, Darby. But who would you want to be? I'd probably say I want to be somebody like Half Dan, like this amazing like son of Ragnar Lothbrok, who's like ruling over all of Northumbria. But I think in reality, I would probably be somebody like Alvis or Holger in our settlement, who's just like a kind of a funny little poet, you know, who just sings songs and, and writes verses and has a decent command of language, but doesn't really leave his house. <laughs> Uh, so, that's what I wanted to be. <laughs> it, it's like really, that, it's like that. Meme, yeah, it's like that meme where you go like, "Who I am, who I think I am, who others see yes. me as," and I'm like, "Who I think I am is this Viking warrior, who others see me as is this little nebbish little uh, poet." So, <laughs> so are you? That, you is that who you're going to pick as well, Ryan? <laughs> yeah, I would. I would have gone for that. They, uh, you know, as as long as we could, uh, you know, potentially compete on the stage, and uh, you could get the glory of the, you know, the the great payments for your, you know, your your yeah. uh, skaldic poems, and uh, I, I might get a few crumbs <laughs> off the floor. I'm, I'm good at writing uh, Lu- Lucy, can, who would, Lucy, who would you be? 
Uh, maybe I would be Volca the seer, because the seer sees the future and the historian studies past. So both travel through times. Ah, that's a good answer. Thierry, come on, top that. Who would you be? Oh, n no one. I know something that no one ever chooses uh, Anglo-Saxon. Everyone relates <laughs> immediately to, to Vikings. <laughs> so so I, I would choose uh, Alfred. Also, Alfred the Great, but also because Alfred resisted. After all, he resisted. He was he was down. <laughs> he was, he was uh, about to be to be whipped out from history, and he he resisted yeah. well and, and saved England. So, so why not Alfred? Without pretension, I will be. There's, there's some Ill, <laughs> Ill health issues for Alfred that, that put me off with that, <laughs> yes. uh, that particular one. But. It's part of the cost. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Fizz, how about you? Um, I guess for me, it would probably be. Gunnar, our, our blacksmith, like someone who's been a warrior in the past, but now is just too old and like is done with that life and just likes to make weapons and armor for people. Yeah. And I like that that sort of duality, like that at, at some point, I think we all get to a point where we want a quieter life. Um, and I think Gunnar's life is, is, is a decent one. Yeah, and oh, yeah, exactly. Wow. He's just on a on a quest for love. Fizz, I don't know. I would have thought like twenty twenty would have made you want to have a bit more excitement in your life, but you're kind of kicking it back even more horizontal. And actually, you know what? Maybe that's the direction we all need to go in. Um, but look, um, thank you so so much to uh, all of our panelists. Uh, we'll be back in just a few moments with our next panel. Now, some may say, well, I say that. Assassin's Creed is a bit like the sort of TMZ of history. You know, it's always looking for the kind of go-to big names to kind of draw you in with a good little bit of salacious gossip. Well, and interesting plot lines. Uh, so uh, joining us on this panel uh, to talk about some of the famous characters we're going to be meeting within the game. Uh, please welcome back uh, Fizz, Darby and Thierry. So hi, guys. How are you doing? Hey, good. good. Hello. Do you, do you appreciate the TMZ of history thing or perhaps not? <laughs> it's appropriate it sets the tone okay good fantastic there we go um so obviously we're going to be meeting uh some uh, big characters within the game who were actually you know around uh during uh, well in, in reality they were actual characters um darby who are we going to be meeting and uh, why did you pick them yeah i think we kind of alluded earlier that the um when we chose the viking age <clears throat> we honed in on this per, uh, particular setting because um, the invasion of England actually it does have a, a, a pretty good cast of characters that we can draw from, um, even though this is the Dark Ages and, and we don't know a whole lot about it. Um, it's thanks to things like um, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, which is just a list of things that happened that Alfred the Great made, and the, uh, the sagas. We can pull from those and we actually learn a lot of names. Um, so um, one important group uh, that came uh, to prominence in this time was called the Great Heathen Army. And it was a bunch of Vikings who came over um, and the leaders of this group claimed to be the sons of a, of a Viking named Ragnar Lothbrok. They had come to England to get revenge uh, for their father's death. And so we got guys like Ivar, who had the surname The Boneless, Ivar The Boneless, um, <laughs> Uba, and a guy named Halfdan. And these were all very prominent Viking figures at the time. Um, Halfdan actually ended up being kind of the, uh, the, the de facto king of Northumbria. Um, and then there was another group of Vikings that came in a few years later called the Great Summer Army. Um, and he was, that was led eventually by a guy named Guthrum. And Guthrum actually went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Alfred the Great. So on the Viking side, we have a lot of uh, uh, fun characters like that. Plus, we've got a few more surprises uh, waiting for you. Um, and on the uh, Saxon side, we have, of course, Alfred the Great. But we actually have all the kings of... Uh, of uh, England at the time. There were four kingdoms. So there's uh, Alfred of Wessex. There's Burgred of Mercia, but he gets deposed by a guy named Cheowulf, which we saw in our demo. And there's actually a king in the north called Rishia, who's also a puppet king. So we actually got to bring a lot of these uh, these sort of famous leaders together and you're going to get to meet every single one of them. I'm loving this. I'm, I'm making a mental note that uh, next time I go to a pub quiz where there's the potential for anything Viking-y, <laughs> I'm just calling up Derby and bringing him over because like this is some good knowledge. I'm, I'm right your, now. Um, I'm your, uh, <laughs> your call. <laughs> um, Thierry, um, who is this? Uh, so I'm, am I pronouncing this right? Ragnar Luth Luthbrook? Who is this person? Oh, Ragnar Luthbrook. Luth he's Probably the, the most famous legendary Viking leader. Uh, actually, historians don't even know if he existed, 
but he, he was so influential. The character in the, as he appeared in the, the saga was so influential that uh, many, many uh, actual Viking leaders uh, claimed to be his uh, his sons one way or another, truth, truth or not. They pretended, they pretended to, to, to listen from him. And he, he was very active in, uh, in France. He was supposed to have uh, participated in the Siege of Paris, but he was also very active in, uh, in England. And supposedly, according to the legend, he died in England and his sons uh, went to, to, to seek uh, revenge for, for his death. See, it's just like TMZ gossip, you know, people claiming things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Fizz, you've got your kind of celebrity characters from history here. Uh, in, in terms of actually, you know, kind of uh, ad adapting them and putting them into making, you know, great kind of gameplay and, and, and stories and quests and stuff like that. Um, how much do you kind of glean from their history or do you kind of just use it as like a jumping off point for sort of inspiration? I mean, it, it, it was pretty easy to get inspiration from it because like... I what the guys were telling like it sounds like a like a testosterone filled soap opera um where you're surrounded by like a very colorful cast of characters everybody has their own personality and their own objectives um there's turmoil and, and conflict between all of them so for us it was like it was pretty easy pickings in a sense of trying to inspire ourselves from them each territory focuses on individual characters and we can sort of delve a little bit deeper in each of the, uh, these characters so we can have things like um one of the demos that we showed recently where you follow Ivar and Uba, the, the the basically the rock stars of that era when it comes to Vikings. Um, so you know, going along that journey and being alongside the, these these bigger than life characters, um, you have more political stories when it comes to Alfred the Great and seeing all the 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 sort of very very soap opera like backstabbing and um, like the family affairs that you would think about like when you think about the, the Tudors or things like that. Um, so it, it was just very easy to sort of take the story stories, as uh, Darby was saying, the sagas, and then spin off of them and give players um, their place and their objective and their role to play in that. One of the prominent figures within the game is Alfred the Great. So Darby, what can you tell us about him? Alfred, uh, Alfred is the king of Wessex at this time, uh, which is the southernmost kingdom in England. Um, he's probably somebody we know the most about. Um, he was written about quite a lot. There's a bishop named Astor who wrote about his life. Uh, he also commissioned the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which is kind of how we know so much about this time period on the uh, English side. Um, he came to the throne when he was very young. His brother, Ethelred, had been king for about uh, five or six years, and, and um, Ethelred and Alfred actually were in a battle with the Vikings down in the south, um, and his brother was mortally wounded and, and never recovered, so uh, Alfred had to step up, and he was the like the the last of six kids, so he had never really thought that he would become king, but they all got picked off one at a time by disease or battle, and so here he was at like 22, and now he was the king of Wessex. Um, he was a very pious man. He was also known to be afflicted with a, a, a chronic disease. They're not sure what it was. It might have been something like Crohn's disease, um, but it was kind of crippling. Uh, but he overcame that, um, and uh, he uh, took the Vikings on like, head on. Um, for a while, he tried to treat the Vikings who invaded his country with <clears throat> a kind of mutual respect. He he was very pious Christian. He would have um, he would swear uh, a treaty on the the cross, and he would ask the Vikings to do the same on a on a hammer of Thor, um, and they would kind of look at him like he was crazy, and they would do it anyway, and then they'd turn around and rob him blind. So <clears throat> it took him a few years to get uh, hip to the uh, Vikings tactics, uh, but when he did, he was a formidable opponent. So we portray him as a as a fairly canny guy, uh, very pious. Um, and he wants what's best for England um, and Wessex and England. He's the first to think of England as a full kingdom rather than a series of smaller kingdoms. Um, and he really would sort of prefer that the Vikings just convert to Christianity because he's cool with them being there as long as they're Christian. Uh, they just got to be, you know, on his team. So you're going to see a lot of that in our game where he's gently prodding them and trying to get them to um, not leave, but uh, convert. And um, and that's where a lot of the tension and drama comes from. And Alfred sort of in the game, he looks kind of OK, but uh, someone uh, who doesn't look quite so well is um, Ivar. Fizz, what can you tell us about Ivar? Um, Ivar uh, 
uh, one of the he's one of the historical characters that we have in the game. Um, we we call him Ivar the Boneless. It was one of his nicknames um, back in the time. Um, he, he's rumored to be one of the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok, uh, which we talked about earlier on. Ragnar had many many sons, or people claim to be the sons of. Uh, Ragnar, there's a lot of them. Um, and so for us, there's two characters that we chose, Ivar the Boneless and Uba. Um, and we decide to play them off as as brothers um, because they both claim to be sons of Ragnar. Um, and and we sort of represent them in, in um, as a duality or different representations of Viking culture. Ragnar, uh, sorry, um, Ivar is the representation of old, old school Vikings who are out for glory, out for war, um, who will, who wants to die by the sword. Um, and Uba is the representation of diplomacy and looking forwards for a new way, a unification and, and try and just find uh, a, a peaceful future uh, for Vikings. And so you can imagine these two philosophies sort of coming into conflict uh, against one another. And you as a, as, a, as a character, as Eivor, get to sort of witness that conflict as you go through their stories um and for us it was just a good way of representing that duality between the 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 viking philosophies and thierry so you know again you know it seems like you guys have lots and lots of information on these characters but but again i mean you're working from not too much actual real factual information that you can find Yes, we know very little normally about uh, those characters. In some cases, we don't even know if they existed. I mean, uh, in the case of uh, Uba, for example, as I just mentioned, that was overwritten uh, centuries later. You know, in a text, they mentioned that there was a son of Ragnar that was Uba. But uh, in the case of uh, of uh, Ivar, yes, there was a huge uh, historical character that was. Uh, Iva, possibly the boneless. Uh, we know little about him, but we know that he was a really very influential king. He was very active, uh, obviously, in the Great Eastern Army in uh, in England. He was also very influential in uh, in Ireland and uh, all around the, the Irish Sea. And uh, many kings of the period, petty, petty kings of the period, were later were sons of uh, of that uh, Iva that claimed to be obviously son of Ragnar himself. Why, why did everyone want to be the son of this guy? Were they claiming cash from him? Like, what was what was the deal? <laughs> I think I think it's the notion of like yeah, people just trying to attach their fame to somebody else, right? Like saying I'm oh, the son of a- royalty. So like Ragnar was royalty when it comes to Viking, and so automatically yeah. by being their sons, you have instant fame. Yeah. This sounds exactly Fam- like TMZ stroke YouTube. Exactly. Right <laughs> Family was very important at this time. So, uh, you know, mm. the idea that you're, you know, the son of somebody important it immediately gave you clout. So you've looked at lots of different kind of historical documents to kind of glean some of this information. But was there anywhere kind of a bit more unusual that you kind of had the spark of imagination about someone from history? Um, yeah, there. Um, we talked a lot about how um, I think earlier with uh, the historians about how there's just not that many documents now left to sort of discover uh, new new information from. So archaeologically now is where everybody's looking, and often you find big hordes of coins and treasures. And one of the fun things we found was that in one treasure hoard um, in East Anglia, they found two coins with uh, a king printed on it, um, Oswald of East Anglia, and I think it was Ethelred of East Anglia, and they both had the same year um, printed on it, uh, 876. So just based on that one uh, coin alone, they determined, okay, there was some guy in East Anglia in this one year claiming to be king of East Anglia. This is right in the Viking invasion. So it's not clear what he was doing or who he was. He was probably a Viking puppet. But we took that a single coin and we said, okay, we have an Oswald of East Anglia now. And we created a character uh, based on that single coin. Um, and now it actually so happens that since we've put out our demo and you've met Oswald briefly, um, that when you do a Google search for Oswald of East Anglia, our character pops up because it's the only time he's ever been rendered in any sort of narrative or dramatic form in, in history, I, I think. So after a thousand years of being uh, unknown, he's now has his time in the sun, Oswald of East Anglia. 
So I feel we've kind of like scratched the itch in terms of historical celebrities. What can we see from sort of, sort of you know, a more kind of mythological realm? You know, for starters, who's this guy? This cute little boy is uh, one we like to call Fenrir. Um, Fenrir is uh, was portrayed in the in the Eddas. There's one of the first poems that you that you read is called the Voluspa, which is the story of Odin going to see a seer and trying to get insight on what awaits him. What what is going to be the fate of the gods, um, and specifically his fate. Um, and ultimately, the the the. The story goes that Fenrir, this giant wolf, will eat Odin, and that will be the, the final act of Ragnarok. Um, and so the, you can imagine that this completely occupies Odin's brain, and he is obsessed with trying to find a way to avoid that fate and, and basically get out of it. Um, so that, that, that's... I mean, I'm not Fenrir surprised... Is. I mean, if you saw that and you're like, hey, by the way, Fizz, that's going to bring about your demise. You're going to be mushed and chomped in its jaws. You try going to sleep at night after having that image emblazoned upon you. Heaven's sake, honestly. Um, so, OK, this guy is, I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying, you know, the kind of more animalistic sort of thing here, but he's a bit scary. What can we see that's going to be really cute? Because I feel like we all need a little bit of cuteness right now. What can we have? <laughs> Um, so in the image here, you can see puffins and seals. Um, these were not things that we initially had in mind when we started making the game. It came about um, during our uh, our scouting trip, which we talked about earlier, um, where we were at some place in England called Ravenscar, and we ended up going down this cliff. And lo and behold, we found this huge herd of seals just very, very up close, which for us Canadians, we've never seen uh, seals that close up. And that sort of automatically was a group decision like we have to have these in the game um so at least you'll have that to sleep help you sleep at night so what can we do with the seals what can do we bring them to do they do our bidding like what happens what can we do with them you just boop their snoots that's it <laughs> you know what I'm, i will take a booping of a snoot actually this year <laughs> actually, I'm fully over it. <laughs> but there's another there's another um part of the in the game where you, you're guiding seals through a gate or something i remember seeing a clip of that yeah, we just have a, um, a little mushroom activity. You take a mushroom, you, you, you get a little hallucination, and there's some kind of strange puzzle to solve, and the seals are there, and they, they appear to help you solve this puzzle. So um, they're very friendly in this game. Please treat them with respect. So they're cute and useful. This is exactly what everyone needs right now. Um, well, I think that's probably all the time uh, we have for this uh, panel. I just want to say a big, big thank you to you all for, for coming and uh, joining us over the course of today and kind of sharing all your insight and all the kind of fun you've had making the game. And uh, I didn't think I could be more excited about Assassin's Creed Valhalla, but I think actually now I am. So well done, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having me. And that's it. That's all the time we've got for this very special Assassin's Creed Valhalla event. And thank you so much for joining us. The making of Assassin's Creed Valhalla has been an incredible journey for all of the teams involved. And they really wanted to share with you, you know, some of the insights into the creation of this uh, amazing game. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is out now. I mean, you should already be playing it, but if you didn't know, it's out now. And if you want any further information about the game or, you know, to kind of find out more about anything raised in uh, any of the uh, round tables, any of the discussions that were had, uh, there's some links in the description below. And also just um, let Ubisoft know if you'd like to see more of this kind of content. And uh, yeah, I've been Julia Hardy. This has been Assassin's Creed Valhalla, a very special digital event. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next time. How to become England's new landlord when no one wants to give you the keys? It's simple. Reputation. The reputation that could make him, her, or even him, a myth. Above all, you must learn the know-how. First, dress to impress. And then, make an entrance. They think we are barbarians. Do not disappoint them. And after all that, loot, of course. Don't just take anything. Take what they love the most. Obviously, they will expect us to kill everyone. 
But make sure to let someone, him in this case, go and tell whomever that the devil is making himself at home. And this is how you make your way into history and earn your place in Valhalla. Play it on the all-new Xbox.